going to do a little bit different. Get the Actually, we're going to do a little bit different on the on the agenda, uh, and go to item seven and come back to items one through six in a few minutes. We do not have a quorum yet. We expect that quorum to be here. So uh, when we get to that, we will go back to those <coughs> items one through seven. Eric, you going to do? Item seven. I'll start off with that, if that's okay, and then we'll we'll pick up from there. Um, one of the things that is a primary focus in this year, the development of the 2021 budget, is a comprehensive review of our pay plan or our compensation plan. Uh, and so I want to take you through that generally, and then talk about a specific uh, related proposal I, I I would like to work on and bring forward uh, for consideration to implement uh, a little early. So go ahead and um, pull that up. Yeah, there it is. Um, this should be on your, uh, if you refresh it, it should be there. Okay, it should be there. Um, so like I said, we, we did a full pay plan. Uh, we brought on a new pay, pay plan back in 2014, 2013, 2014, implemented that over a two year cycle. Our commitment at the time was to update that every three years. Uh, we did that in 2017 and implemented, took the actual implementation steps in January of 18 and July of 18, uh, and then um, are in that process again so that we would uh, look at a, a comprehensive update in 2021. Uh, we have our consultant on board, Burris Thompson, had worked with us on that. They're, they're back uh, contracted to do that work and are already starting to engage with our departments, HR, city administration, and our budget team in doing that work. Um, so uh, that last bullet is actually a carryover. I should have taken that out. <laughs> Go ahead and move us on to the next slide. Uh, so again, our target as we do this is to place ourselves in the top tier in terms of where we uh, pay versus the market. We look at both public and private. There are some there is a very uh, comparable <coughs> private market to look at. Others, it's, it's largely public, but we blend it wherever we can. And we want to be in that top 85th percentile or the top 15% of, uh, of, of uh, folks in the market that we compare ourselves position by position. So that does not change. That continues to be our focus. There is a specific issue that I've had both, uh, both the police chief and the fire chief raise different areas, but in the, the same uh, vein in terms of a concern around uh, the recruitment and retention of frontline employees in a, in a certain key way. Let's go to the next slide. We'll kind of walk through that. Uh, some of the things we've already done is we've been more aggressive in doing what you'd call lateral hires, folks that are already in the profession, have the, uh, the training or certifications to do the work, but maybe coming over from another uh, jurisdiction. Our uh, enrollment and participation in TCRS has been a huge positive in that. So we have people that are already committed to the profession. They know they want this to be their, you know, their career, their life's work. And uh, we know we are an attractive place to work and being in TCRS allows them to continue to build on uh, maybe a pension they started in another jurisdiction and come and work with us. So that has been helpful. We also, uh, both chiefs have been uh, willing and, and uh, able to go ahead and, and start some of those lateral transfers a little bit above the minimum pay that, that, that they might otherwise come in. That makes us a little more competitive. Uh, and, and we do give each of our department directors, regardless, uh, some flexibility to work within that initial part of the pay grade when we're competing to bring in folks from the outside. So that is, that is competitive as well. Um, the other, the other part that we see is uh, in, the, in the fire component is the challenge of recruiting and retaining folks, especially with the para paramedic certification. And that is a stipend based right now, it's a, so it's sort of a, a set amount. And that amount has not been adjusted in at least 12, 13 years. Um, and so we have lagged behind the market now in that area as well. So there's a specific proposal. Um, I'll be honest with you, it does not necessarily require the board's approval, but it's a big enough move. I want to bring it to your attention and get your uh, endorsement in, in making this move. Michael, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, what I would like to do effective April 1 
is make two changes uh, and two targets that would help us in, uh, I believe, be highly competitive and really be a leader in uh, recruiting and retra retaining folks in these key positions. Uh, again, in the police department, we want to continue to be aggressive in bringing in experienced officers, and, and I think Chief continues to look at where that right level is to bring in officers that have experience and have the certification. We'll continue to, to look at that. But what I would like to do is uh, start a program where we target uh, officers that come in and when they've passed their probationary period, which is a 12-month period, that we'll bring them to $50,000. So we can tell people when we're recruiting them, in 12 months, you prove yourself, show that you can be the kind of officer we want in the city of Franklin, we'll bring you up to $50,000 as your base pay. We think that will be a difference maker that will set us uh, apart from some of the other folks in our market that are competing for uh, folks that are looking at the police officer positions, either folks that are coming into it fresh that we'll have to train or folks that may come in with some experience and certification. But at the end of the day, after 12 months, if they've proven themselves, let's bring them to that $50,000 level. We think that'll be a huge benefit in recruitment and retaining people that there's that, that uh, commitment to get them to that pay level uh, after, the, after they've come on board. The other element would be the paramedic pay. As I said, we have not adjusted that in well over 10 years to adjust that $2,000 but to also convert it so that it is part of the hourly rate. So that will allow it to continue to move as we make salary adjustments and also uh, be eligible for uh, any overtime that those folks might work. So uh, collectively, when you look at those adjustments in fiscal 20, um, it's about $110,000 uh, adjustment. If you annualize that, it's about $300,000 in the police department and uh, uh, about 140,000 when we factor in an estimate of potential overtime impact uh, in uh, the fire department. Uh, these are two initiatives, and I probably should have invited both chiefs up here to, to, to be up here to uh, allow them to, to say some, uh, make some comments about how this is supportive to, to what they're trying to achieve in terms of attracting and retaining the best uh, staff team members we can. Uh, but I, I'd like to move forward with making these adjustments, we, we would need to look at any potential budget amendment that would be related to that. That would really be where the formal action of the board would come in. Uh, but, you know, generally you give myself and the um, department directors some latitude in where we set it, uh, pays, pay ranges. Uh, these would all be pretty much in line with what's in place now, but it would be a different framework in how we start people at the police officer position um, and then uh, how we handle uh, the paramedic stipend pay, or now which would convert into a, a, a pay differential on the hourly pay. Um, let me invite the chiefs up. If you have any other uh, comments that you want to make about these adjustments in your individual departments, we've worked through this with both. Uh, independently, they both had identified these issues as, uh, as concerns in the market and places where we were uh, maybe not doing as well as we wanted to in that, in that area and, and that could be real, not just address any deficiency, but really help us uh, be at the forefront and be a, a really attractive employer for folks that want to serve in public safety, especially in these key frontline positions. So let me allow either the chiefs to, to comment on how this would impact uh, what they're working with. Well, Mr. Stuckey is absolutely right. Um, in our ability to go out and uh, cast our nets to bring in the best qualified candidates, this will help us tremendously. I mean, there's no doubt. And I suspect that from now on, when we post openings, that the surrounding agencies around Franklin will be cringing because they know that we offer a quality opportunity. This is a great place to work. It's, it's a population that is so supportive of public safety. Um, why would you not want to work here? And certainly now you can check off the fact that they lose money to come to work here. And I've been very fortunate in that I have recruited some young men and women from area law enforcement and they took a drop in pay. I've got uh, three now from Metro Nashville PD. I've got several from other surrounding agencies. They took a cut in pay to come to work here. And, you know, I want to be able to maintain them and keep them, but also I'm attracting a lot of young men and women who are right out of college, and those are good candidates too. So um, 
this is a great opportunity for us. Your support on this is, is greatly valued and appreciated, and I know it will be for the men and women of the Franklin Police Department, not to mention the ones who already work here um, and looking forward to um, other parts of the PACE study, I think, as well, that Mr. Stuckey has worked very hard on. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Mr. Stuckey, for bringing up this point. Um, as far as the par paramedic pay goes, Mr. Stuckey is right. We haven't looked at that or adjusted that in over 10 years. And also the fact that we're changing it and putting it into their hourly pay helps them more toward their pension as well. Uh, the stipend did not go into their pension. And so in, when I try to explain that to a young person coming on in the agency, this, this is something that a uh, benefit for you for the rest of your life because it goes into your pension even after you do your time and service here. So it's a great benefit. Uh, and y'all all know what we do about 70% of our job is taking care of people from a medical perspective nowadays. And so um, we, we've already garnered a lot of interest from people that are employees in other fire departments near nearby um, because of TCRS now. They can transport their years from without giving any cities close by away. They can bring those years of service uh, in TCRS and come over here and enhance their salaries and it helps them toward a shorter career with us potentially, but um, it puts us able to recruit some really good candidates. And we end up saving money uh, on the training side when we bring folks in who already have the certifications, whether it's post or paramedic um, certifications. We don't have to go spend the time and money to bring them up to that level. They're already there. We got to get them oriented to our practices, <clears throat> excuse me, and procedures. But that's a much shorter time frame and and uh, and really more efficient for us. So th there's a benefit there. I do want to stress that this does ripple through uh, existing officers that are in the, the police officer classification um, will make adjustments across that police officer group um, and so that will have impact there. Everybody who's currently got the paramedic stipend, that amount will go up for them. Uh, and then of course others that get that training subsequently that are with us now would also receive that. Uh, and then of course it helps us on the recruitment. So it, it's not just for the new folks coming in, it has a impact that ripples through um, the, the, the existing job classification group, uh, those with paramedic certifications and those in the police officer uh, rank would, would be impacted uh, positively as well. This is the first step in what we will do in the pay plan. Uh, this was just important enough and I think from a timing standpoint, we're recruiting right now. Uh, I wanted to get that out there early. Um, there will be other adjustments that happen across the organization, both within the police and fire department, but across every department that we will incorporate in the proposed budget. That's part of what we did when we committed to this uh, new pay plan. We committed to do a full um, review and update every three years, and we're on that, that cycle right now, and that will be part of what you see in the budget uh, that we bring to you in May will reflect that. This just is advancing this component a little earlier to help us with recruitment now um, and then we'll have other components that will fall and probably impact other ranks in both of these departments as well as departments across the organization. So I guess I just ask for any reaction. I, if you're comfortable enough with this, I'd like to bring some form of briefing on this to the next work session to the full board, but I wanted to start here and get any feedback you have and any any other information. We do have some more specific um, market comparables that might help you understand what we're looking at. For example, I know the paramedic pay and, and some other jurisdictions is in that five to 6,000 range and that's where we're lagging behind. Um, and we can show you what we're, what we're facing on some more specifics there, but um, glad to get any feedback you have. Uh, just to talk about the one thing that you said that may be seem minor but is very important is putting that uh, paramedic stipend into the regular pay. I mean, as a 
retiree for, from TCRS, I can tell you an extra thing. I, I remember my summer school pay made a great deal of difference, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the long run. And uh, also I did get something from them saying, you know, we are one of the top five retirement systems uh, mm -hmm. in, you know, state retirement systems in the U.S., so that also too. But as I say, that part about letting that count for you is important mm -hmm. too. And as well as, I, 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 you know, I can see what you're talking about on the rest of this too. Mm -hmm. You referenced a rippling effect within, I, of course, the rippling effect wouldn't necessarily be in the police department, but in the, I mean, in the fire department, but in the police department. Make sure we don't leave anyone that's here now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm concerned about new hires, and I'm right. concerned about uh, the, the going out and canvassing and getting new hires, but we have an obligation to mm -hmm. those who are currently mm -hmm. working. So if this is the case, so if this goes into effect, no police officer would be making less than 50000 after one year? Right. Okay. If you've successfully completed nope, your probation, no. 50000 really becomes the new floor. Okay. And then we're going to need to make adjustments that ripple that through the, that rank. Oh. Yes. Now, there may be other adjustments we need to make when we make, uh, when we look at this and what we recommend for the 21 budget. But this is, right now, we're just targeting this rank and this element because it's where we recruit and bring people in but it's going to affect everybody that's here now as well as what we what we talk about and what we market to folks that are looking at coming on board chief and chief thank you thank you thank you Thanks. and we'll see you in a few minutes all right <laughs> appreciate thank your you. consideration on this this is very important okay. to, to us thank you do we want to go back to item one are you sure? Approved? Yeah. Uh, let, let's go back Thank to item you. one then, and we'll approval of minutes from the January the 9th, 2020 Finance Committee meeting. Entertain a motion. Second. Proper motion and a second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Item two consideration of draft resolution number 2020 08, <laughs> a resolution to revise the organizational charter of the fire department. We will vote on all two through six, uh, but uh, Michael will do the presentation on mm -hmm. those as we go through it. So what, what we thought we would do to save a little bit of time, and, and any of the departments that are here that have an org chart change certainly can speak to it if they wish. Um, would, I'm going to cover items two through six all at once because they are all relatively minor in nature. Um, to give you a heads up, this will be the first of several months of organizational chart changes. We think there's about, I think at last count, 10 that require minor adjustments and changes um, as we've gone through the year and realized that we need to, to make these adjustments. There is no direct financial impact from any of these changes. Um, and all changes uh, included within these five resolutions uh, reflect either the position title being changed or some version of an operational change. So, in summary, the first resolution, 2020-08, is a simply a title change of the Administrative Services Officer to Administrative Captain of Technology. Since fire is up here, if they wish to say something briefly, feel free to. Yeah. Yes, before you, you have a resolution, and I will draw your attention to section one and the first bullet point, uh, where we're just changing the title of a particular uh, position. Uh, the administrative service officer, which is a pay grade I, shall be reclassified to the position of administrative captain of technology which is at a pay grade I. So like Michael said, there's no financial impact whatsoever. For us, it's operational pay change uh, just to um, change the title of that particular employee. The second org chart uh, change is resolution 2020-09. That's within the police department. That is simply to uh, reassign uh, where individuals report to to reflect current operational deployment. The third resolution, resolution 2020-10, within the Parks Department changes three titles. The first is to change recreation foreman to recreation supervisor. The second is to change the grounds and landscaping foreman to grounds and landscaping supervisor. 
And the third is to change athletic workers, there are six of those budgeted, to turf specialist twos and turf specialist ones. Sanitation, resolution 2020-12 uh, has two title changes. One is to change a vacant SES crew supervisor position to technical support specialist one. And the second is to change administrative secretary to an administrative assistant. And the final organizational chart change is resolution 2020-16 in the revenue management department. That is both a title change and an organizational um, restructuring within the department. And that changes the position of account management supervisor to a billing and collections technician. Like I said, all relatively minor, but we want to get them cleaned up because the budgets that you're about to see have these versions of work charts in them because we felt that they were decently minor and, and appropriately well structured. And we all these changes would be made by resolution, right? There's no that's budgetary. Correct. That's correct. These are either flat in terms of budget impact or in some cases a little bit of a reduction. So mm -hmm. they all work within the existing budget. You're, you, you have the authority granted to the city administrator in the budget ordinance to propose organizational chart changes in this regard without having to do three votes. So we thought it most prudent to do that. We will ask for individual votes on all of them to forward them to the board, however. All right, let's go to item two. You've heard the presentation. This is a motion to forward this to the full board for consideration. I'll entertain a motion and the comments will be the same on three, four, five, and six. So move that we recommend it to the board. Second. Proper motion and a second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Item three, same heading. Recommend to the full board. Uh, proper motion to second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Item four. Same heading. <laughs> second. Second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Item five. Same heading again. So moved. Second. Now we're getting there. We're practicing. <laughs> we're getting better. You're rotating. That's yes. Like yes. Yeah. <laughs> proper motion to the second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Item six. Same heading. So moved to Second. It. Second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed to any of those? Okay. Let's go to item eight. That is the budget presentation for the police department and the drug fund. Chief Fulton, you're up. Good afternoon. Mayor Moore, who's up on the upper gallery, <laughs> and Alderman Martin. Um, they can hear better up there. They can. <laughs> Alderman Barnhill, Peterson, Speedy, and Mr. Stuckey, our city administrator. I'm honored to be here today to represent the dedicated men and women of the Franklin Police Department. With me today, Deputy Chief Greg Policastro, uh, Captain J.P. Taylor is behind us, our fiscal manager, Will McCarville, Lieutenant Tommy Justice, Lieutenant Scott Legaza, and my backup team back there I'll introduce in just a minute. The budget that you have today for your review and consideration represents the needs of the Franklin Police Department for the next fiscal year. It's basically a status quo budget there is a slight increase in regarding our utilities and we also have a built-in information in there and cost for conducting our annual promotional process i would not bring you a budget with a lot of nice to haves i'm extremely physically conservative i consider what we need in order to provide quality law enforcement services to the people we serve because they deserve nothing less than our best. We'll always be a model for excellence and to maintain our core values of integrity, courage, honor, and duty. I want to thank each of you for always being supportive of your police officers. Now, 
I'm just going to cut to the chase because you've got a long agenda. I'm only going to present to you seven program enhancements in this budget. The first one and the fifth one have an impact over the next three to five years. Now, I carefully analyzed the needs of the department and the city and narrowed them down to the ones that replace outdated equipment and added police officers to keep up with Franklin's growth. So here we go, first up. Funding for six new police officers. That's our color guard in the slide there. They're representing us in this particular picture during the 9-11 celebration that we did in front of police headquarters this year, this past year. Franklin police officers responded to over 76,000 calls for service last year, and they worked 2,361 extra duty and special events. That's over and above their calls for service. These extra event details amounted to almost 11,000 hours. That's 700 hours more than the previous year. Our officers are working hard to keep us safe. That's certainly a given. But it's imperative to have enough officers to cover all of the demands that we receive without impacting the health and wellness of our personnel. This enhancement includes the cost of six new positions and all that's needed to uniform and equip them. Number two, funding for phase two for replacing our tasers. This is the second year of a two-year program to replace our tasers. The ones that the department have are outdated. They're past their service life, and we will no longer be able to purchase parts for them. You approved phase one last year. This request will replace the remaining tasers, holsters, batteries, and so on that we need for a total upgrade. And that's a picture of enhancement number two on the screen. Number three, firearms and related uh, supplies. We're requesting to add some new long guns to the armory for our field officers, plus mounted pistol lights used in the high threat or low light situations. I've listed specifically what this purchase is on the uh, handout that you have. And you can see the picture there on the slide. Number four, an increase in the overtime budget. Now, I don't have to tell you, you all remember, as I do drastically, that the law enforcement profession changed after 9-11. It changed again after the mass shooting in Las Vegas. Homeland security is a top priority for us. Increasing the overtime budget allows for additional officers when needed to cover these events and it will provide the latitude to assign directed patrols regarding specific community policing initiatives in our neighborhoods. Number five, and this is one of those that could impact over the next three to five years, firing range upgrades. I'm almost embarrassed to show you that slide, but that's the way it looks right now. The Franklin Police Department gun range is 16 years old and in need of some major work. It needs a facelift in the worst kind of way. The automated target system needs to be replaced. The technology is outdated and unreliable. The range masters have patched it and put together workarounds, but they continue to break down. Here's the bottom line. It's worn out and we need to make it operational. Number six, dive team inflatable boat. And this is not a nice to have. This is, we really need this. And there's a picture of um, what we're talking about. The Franklin Police Department has an out, outstanding group of six swift water divers, and they're with me today. And if you stand up when I say your name so they can see you, Lieutenant Rick Klaus, Master Patrol Officer Adam Cohen, Officer Sean Finn, Detective Ryan Grandi, Officer Brandon McClellan, and I believe Officer Cody Walter could not be here today. He's uh, out of the state at training. Officer John McClendon's also back there, who's also been a diver and a member of our SWAT team. He's a Master Patrol officer. They work and train hard to be the best that they can be. 
They are rescue swimmer certified, advanced swift water certified. They are expert in various scuba disciplines to include underwater evidence recovery and preservation. When they are in, uh, deployed with other divers, they have the additional responsibility and expertise of providing security to the public, other personnel, and property. We have the guns to go with it. Their last out-of-state deployment was during Hurricane Florence, for which they received the Franklin Police Department's life-saving medal. They also received an award from our friends at the Franklin Fire Department who also deployed with our police officers. Now, there's a new FEMA policy that requires that if you send a swift water team, they gotta have a boat. We wanna always be ready. I mean, this week is a good example of always being ready with a Harper River rising the way it has. But we wanna be prepared whenever there's a life-saving event. So what you see on the screen, what you saw, um, is an inflatable rescue boat for a dive team. It's a motor and a trailer, and that's what we wanna purchase. Now the last request is for mobile radios for 10 special service police vehicles. The radio system was recently upgraded. The number of radios purchased did not include several of our specialized units, including our crime scene van, our flex teams, warrant service vehicle, and so on. There's 10 of them. This purchase will complete the mobile radio upgrade in the police fleet. And that's my seven enhancements. And if you're okay, I'll go directly to the drug fund. The drug fund is established by state law in order for law enforcement agencies to set up a special revenue account for drug investigations. This revenue comes in the form of drug offense fines, any cash that's forfeited, and the sale of forfeited property from illegal drugs. There are strict guidelines by law for the use of these funds, and we follow those guidelines to the letter. We're keeping this budget status quo. We will never spend more than we have in this fund, and in fact, there are no major expenditures planned for this fund as of now. This concludes my request. Scott. Now, my one question would be, we've, we've talked about maybe, you know, increasing the, the starting pay for recruitment and the retention mm -hmm. being, you know, looking, I guess, the numbers last year, you had about at least 400,000 overtime. Do we need eight new officers versus six? So would that, is there a correlation then with those additional eight? I guess adding six is not going to be a pure, ex, pure expense because it might bring down your overtime hours. Would that help less overtime to help retain people? If I understand you, if we have more officers, would that eliminate some of the overtime? It's possible. There are a number of events that pop up that um, don't employ off-duty officers, but I have, to, I have to send officers for the safety of the public. Um, and, and I don't see that going away. It, it may very well help, and I hope that it does. We only have three vacancies right now, which I think is pretty good. There's a lot of departments around here that can't say that, but we have officers already, uh, officers in training already in the, in the uh, pipeline to be hired um, probably by uh, first part of March. So it, it's possible, and I think most of my staff will tell you that I'm extremely conservative when it comes to overtime. I don't just do it to, to do it. Um, I, um, I watch it very closely. And I know that our physical manager sends me uh, monthly reports, and then he watches uh, to make sure that it's not getting in the red at all. And we, d we divide it by the, the various functions in the department, and so we can see where it's been used and who's using it. We're very, um, we, we closely guard that. So I think, I think um, it would potentially help us with operating, like base operations. That's that kind of overtime, it could help there. On special event and event related, probably not as much. Although one of the things we continually look at is the cost, we try to assign costs to certain events as best we can. We can't always do that. Um, honestly, there are times that, that 
the chief in consultation with me will add more just because we feel like we need to do a little more just to be safe and just to add a little extra to an event even if we've already kind of developed a plan with that organizer we'll just say we want to have a little more presence we just think that mm -hmm. makes sense and I, I i think we always feel that we want to have that flexibility to do that where we need to do it so it would help in some cases not all um, we continue to look at every time we do a special event application and review it what costs are appropriate to assign directly to the event um, but we also always have a mind towards overall safety and our responsibility there too we we never abdicate that to an event organizer we we know that that we own that too okay. another oops, excuse me another example is uh, back in the summer and then also during the holidays when I saw what was happening in area law enforcement uh, not in Franklin but um, in other parts of the Middle Tennessee area where they were having a, a lot of vehicle burglaries and robberies <coughs> you know we set up again not in our mall and not in our neighborhoods and we did saturation patrol. We, we established patterns. We established areas that we thought were vulnerable. We brought our license plate readers in to watch for stolen vehicles. Um, we did all of that. And uh, some of that was on overtime, just because I wanted to make sure it did not impact our ability to respond to calls for service when people needed us. So this was kind of over, above, over and above, and we put them in unmarked vehicles. And they went after it very aggressively. And you didn't hear a lot about it happening here, thank God but it's because of the aggressive patrols. And some of that I did based on looking at our overtime budget, what we could afford to do and do smartly. And uh, it, it made a big difference, I believe. And beginning with our budget request last year, we, asked, we stated our intention to ask for 16 positions over the course of the next few years. So far we've got three, so we're gonna ask for six this year. So you'll see it again. <laughs> this was the other one that we thought had an impact over the next three to five years. Whereabouts are you on the police? I know we did a, we did a several police car replacements mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. Whereabouts are you on those? And we went with Ford Explorer on top of that. We so. did, and, and it's, it's going very smoothly, and uh, that continues to be a, an annual flow. Okay. So, it's, yeah, it's going great. And, the, and they love the Explorers. One of the things that we did after we, we met, had an initiative where we invested you know, $2 million to, to get caught up or to begin to get caught up and try to lower that average cycle time of, of cruisers from some frontline vehicles that we had were, you know, well over a decade. Um, the goal is to get it to, to, to five, to get it, you know, sort of within warranty. You will note that in this budget, the base budget has a million and twenty a million twenty thousand dollars for cruisers. So our goal was to once to restore a baseline amount of cruiser replacement on an annual basis. So we wouldn't have to be, you know, investing quite as much in catching up and, and could actually do some type of, of cycling and cycling through. We're not where we want to be yet, but we're we're taking it on a piece at a time. That's a better baseline than we had before. We did do some effort to catch up. Of course, the at one point we were using lease purchase. Exactly. We can't do that anymore. So that we have to do it this way and and that million dollars is truly a kind of a baseline as we plan out future years that's what we look at as a starting point some years we may be able to do more than that um, but but that we think at least gives us a decent uh, basis to work from and that's why you don't see that here because that's okay. built in but you also don't see any more of those white crown victorias <laughs> and, and very few of the dodge chargers i mean it's a slick fleet that we have. In fact, I had uh, a couple of candidates for police officer that we were about to test and, and they asked us what kind of vehicles we had and everything and when we told them they went, oh wow, I'm in. <laughs> so they were pretty impressed with the fact that we had such a um, um, uh, contemporary fleet. Looks good and it carries, they have a lot of gear that they have to carry. Let me ask. Just those have a better resale than the Very good sedan resale. version. Mm -hmm. The SUVs do. It just does. How, how do you charge back, say, to the pilgrimage? You, you have to send out. So how do you, what do you do on that? Well, they, they pay for a certain number of officers okay. and a certain number of hours. Um, and so that is, that is billed to them, and they pay for that. So, we need, so if, if you determine you need more, mm -hmm. that's part of the overtime budget that you're looking mm -hmm. at here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Aye. And sometimes that depends on the weather or, or what we anticipate or if our intelligence unit picks up on potential threat, you know, I'll have additional SWAT officers or different additional uh, officers working traffic. Okay. Just over and above what had been originally planned. And, you know, there was the incident that happened in California. Mm -hmm. um, and we looked at that and said, what do we need to do? And we made some modifications to how we were deploying some people based on what happened there. Just because you learn not only from your own events, but things that happen other places. And that's an example. And I often had people tell me, um, I, I saw your officers, if it's downtown on the roof, and thank you. And, and they're just there to keep an extra eye. And we did. And we did. We did see them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're kind of hard to hide. <laughs> <laughs> we may not want to hide them. <laughs> no, but I mean, they're, they're just um, very mindful of watching for any threats. Yep. Because we want people to come here and enjoy themselves and have a good time with their children. And that's what it takes to get it done. Any other questions? Any, anyone? Any other comments? Thank you, Chief. Thank, Thank you. you, Chief. Thank Appreciate you. your consideration. Budget presentation for the fire department. <coughs> Fellas, you're back up again. Back up. <laughs> Y'all want to pull that around. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> Rocky, you're up. Thank you, Alderman and uh, Mayor that's visiting today with us here. Um, we're here to present our budget request for the next year. And uh, I'm very humbled to represent the fire department um, as the fire chief and all the dedicated men and women that we have working in this fire department and potentially watching if they're not, not out on a call. They like to listen to the live broadcast of the meetings here and just, you know, let them know we're, we're up here for them and trying to... Um, always look out for them and our agency and the citizens here in this community. As you know, we're an all-hazards fire department. So what does that mean? Well, we're the first agency to, to respond to, obviously, the fire calls that are out there. But the medical calls that are out there that are, you know, that's, like I said before, about 70% of all of our calls to not only our citizens but our visitors in this community. I always mention that because of the major events that we have that we're always involved with those and um, those sick and injured people that may happen in our community that just happen to be visiting. Um, and we respond, we were the first agency to respond to all hazardous material incidents in our city and sometimes in our county. Um, and we're the go-to agency for FEMA here when it comes to um, deploying our resources nationally um, when it comes to hurricanes, natural disasters. So we take a lot of pride in that as an agency. But I have with me today a part of the senior staff, Assistant Chief Johnson, uh, Deputy Chief King. Also, I'd like to say that we have a, a new battalion chief, Ben Marler, with us here in the crowd, as well as battalion chief Joe Polanzani on shift. But, to uh, make this as briefly as possible, I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Chief Johnson now, who's going to walk you through some of the budget items. All right. Thank you all again. Back up here before you. I'd uh, like to go over some of our accomplishments and some of our new initiatives. And just like to say, we couldn't do that without the support of our city leadership, our fire department leadership, and the men and women of this department. So you can see our calls for service this year was around 88. 179 and that shows a, a slight decrease but I think you'll see as our average response time we've been able to shave a little bit off that approximately 11 seconds 
So we've continued to stay busy. Uh, that's, we look for those trends to fluctuate as normal. Some of the achievements this year, <clears throat> one of our big ones was uh, the pilgrimage. And working with our GIS and IT department as well as the other departments within the city, uh, we've built a strong relationship with those departments and uh, have been able to uh, come up with some very worthwhile projects. I'll let uh, Andy speak to the installation of the smoke alarms as part of that program. That is one other aspect that we work with GIS closely is when we install long life, excuse me, when we install long life smoke alarms, we track those with GIS. So if we have a fire incident, we can quickly go back and check and see if we put an alarm in, whether it functioned properly, and then also follow up because they last about 10 years. And we know our target audience per se. Uh, fires is typically a socioeconomic problem, and so we target those specifically with GIS's help. And what I'd like to say is the partnership that we've created with GIS has led to two of our personnel, Andrew Sutherland, Sutherland from um, GIS and Captain Clay Mackey to present on the national stage at the ESRI conference in uh, San Diego. Due to the work they put into a hydrant program, which basically took us from paper to paperless in six months. ESRI has taken that template and put it out nationwide and getting other departments. So we're very proud of that. I am so sorry, but I forgot to introduce Joanne Finn, <laughs> who's put this entire budget together for us. None of this happens without <laughs> Joanne. So that is correct. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. Good save, Chief. <laughs> also, some other uh, achievements we've got is Station 7 is coming up out of the ground in the Goose Creek area. Uh, we look forward to... Uh, open in the next several months. We just took up a uh, delivery of Engine 7. It's in the process of being retrofitted now with new equipment and getting ready to put it into service. Speaking of new equipment, along those same lines, we were very fortunate this year to take uh, uh, possession of our new hazmat, technical rescue, and heavy rescue. Uh, this all kind of went about with our station-specific disciplines when we reorganized the stations. Uh, as, four of our ha as far as our hazmat, I think we've had eight calls now in the last six months where before we would have to assemble crews and then go out the door. With this new alignment, they were able to get the call and respond immediately. So it, it is paying off. We also uh, were able to replace two of our uh, towers, Tower 1 and Tower 2, who had went over their normal replacement life. And I think you'll see a re uh, also a request for Engine 2's replacement uh, in here as we go further on. Uh, other additions that we've had is a training center uh, located on Central Court. We were able to enhance that to give our personnel a better training opportunity uh, to, pr to uh, present more realistic situations. Uh, as far as uh, achievements uh, on our apparatus, like I said, we've already received uh, Engine 7, the Wildland Pupper. We're expecting it sometime during the year. And then Ladder 3, we're actually going up for the pre-conference uh, build on it next month, uh, March 10th and 11th. Uh, we've had uh, promotions uh, throughout the, uh, the year, and we're very proud of those. We'll watch our people progress through the department. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Just for that, you get next. <laughs> yeah, I was congratulating uh, Chief Johnson under with the microphone off for his promotion. But uh, as always, we're very engaged. Uh, the fire service is engaged in the development process in Franklin. And as we know from the numbers from uh, Building and Neighborhood Services, that that trend is continuing and is still a very important component, especially on new construction for commercial buildings. But there's our list of uh, projects that we have dealt with, um, number of inspections, existing inspections on top of that. Uh, the fire department essentially, once we have a new building come up in Franklin, we're, we're still responsible for it for the rest of its life. So any changes that happen, people call us and expect us to deal with those problems and issues. So it never goes away, it just becomes a larger snowball of sorts. Anyway. Uh, child passenger safety seat installs. We're ideally suited to do that with our covered bays. We've got multiple trained technicians on every shift, so people can generally get those done same day. It's a, been a very valuable service to get people in the door and also make our community safer. And um, I'll touch on the CPR program there. We continue to do that again this year. 
but it happens all the time. Even uh, 195 in CPR, including 41 in Spanish, all of those help contribute. People don't forget that knowledge, and uh, we want people to continue to seek us out when they need that type of training and hope they never need to use it. As we continue to talk about our training division, uh, we are very busy. Uh, we've been able to uh, take advantage of some of our local, state, and national resources in uh, uh, training our personnel. Uh, as far as our medical, uh, we continue to uh, see that medical is approximately 65 to 68 percent of our call volume, and we do uh, put a large uh, effort towards ensuring our personnel are ready to respond. We've had uh, a number of specialized rescue trainings that we've been able to conduct here in the city of Franklin and with our neighbors nearby uh, that we respond to in a mutual aid capacity. We've also been able to work with our District 5 Homeland Security partners uh, in instituting our incident management team where we can respond to both local and national uh, events uh, functioning in all hazards capacity. Uh, we've just recently recruit, uh, graduated a recruit class this uh, winter. Uh, which we are still continuing to train others in departments within uh, our uh, proximity. We had Lawrenceburg and I think Murray County this year. So for a grand total of around 51,000 hours is what uh, our personnel uh, have uh, put towards training in, uh, in this year. It's one of the things that we've seen as far as our, our child passenger safety technician that Chief King had recently talked about. I wanted to add this before he takes over, but we've also included that into our recruit program. So any recruit coming through the department now will go through and get certified as a technician so that we always ensure that we have enough depth within our department to, to uh, take care of those persons or those citizens in the community. Yeah. The last point on this slide is that we also received a relatively small grant for 300 smoke alarms and several carbon monoxide alarms, and we're able to go out and do some pre-testing, post-testing in the third grade, identify households that needed those, and then actually go install those. So it's just another um, method of reaching our target group. All right, you've already seen the org chart that we discussed earlier, so unless you have any specific questions on that, we'll move forward. Um, this year's, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> specific schools that you targeted for the third grade class, what schools were they in? Do you remember? I'm not sure the specific ones. I want, want to say Liberty Elementary. Okay. But I'm not sure. Jamie Melton managed that program, and I know we had to reach out to certain third grade classes and get permission, and it was a little bit more work than we anticipated. But Well, the reason I ask, and it doesn't have anything to do with much of anything, other than you've got county and city schools both within, so you would not necessarily just target Franklin Special School District. You would target any school that was in the city limits of Franklin. That's correct, and, and especially for our Family Safety House program, which is the one that we visit all first graders. That's Franklin Special, Williamson County, and even a couple that are serving Franklin, City of Franklin students who live in, or the school is actually in the county, like Oakview and uh, Winstead. Okay. All right, so we talk about our base budget request. Uh, if you see, last year we were a little over 16 million. This year we're looking at 16.968. Uh, this uh, reflects a 5.4% increase in our personnel budget, or $869,447. And uh, we will currently maintain at 172 authorized positions as we stand today. We will have some additional personnel requests, as you'll see later on. Our employee turnover rate, we're staying the course at nine a year on average, especially for the last two years. And currently we're sitting at nine vacancies due to retirements, uh, resignations, and those that are either deployed or on long-term uh, FMLA. When we look at our operations budget, we're showing a little bit of an increase, 3.1%. This is largely due to uh, having to replace all of our SCBA uh, bottles, which is gonna come in at about $125,000. So, we're actually, the increase that you're seeing in the operations budget is due to having to replace those, which is on a replacement schedule uh, every, five, every five years. 
As we go move into our uh, enhancements request, we have 18 from coming out of the general fund and three from facility tax, which uh, we'll just go over some of the highlight, uh, some of the personnel requests first. Um, as we talked about our new uh, employees, we have one new uh, captain that we're asking for that would be assigned to administrative duties. It'd be the captain of program management. This person uh, would oversee our inventory management facilities and procurement. Currently, the uh, captain that was previously known as the administrative services officer was maintaining all of technology and the, the facilities and inventory. That job has just gotten too big for him. He's, with all the technology that we have employed across the city and in the fire department, it takes his, uh, he's full time trying to take care of that. So this person will ensure that our investments are, are taken care of. Uh, as far as our um, another uh, position is our emergency management lieutenant. Uh, that would serve as our main uh, emergency management contact and liaison here in the city. What we looked at at this is uh, during our customer service survey, 80% <clears throat> of the person, our citizens of this community saw that we were a bit deficient in this. And this person would also act in a capacity to ensure that our, our citizens and visitors are aware, you know, prepare Franklin for different types of disasters and how to, uh, you know, what uh, facilities that they could report to and what resources are available in case they do need it. But they'd also serve as uh, the internal emergency management, ensuring that we're prepared to handle any situation that may be a declared or undeclared emergency. The training instructors. Um, we have not increased our training staff since 2007. That's when I was a training officer. Uh, and that consisted of two of us. And here we are in 2020 going in with the same, we only have two training officers. And as you can see with some of the different uh, things that we're challenged with on a daily <coughs> basis is just to change the environment that we're in entails more training, especially in our medical. Uh, during our customer service survey, Franklin's becoming a retirement community. And so we're having to dedicate more time to our uh, uh, medical uh, training as well as our uh, recruit training and our career progression training. This is yours. I thought that might be. Thank you, Joanne. I thought that might be coming up. Uh, this is not a new request. We've asked uh, probably three or four years for three fire safety officers, and that's what they're termed. They would be shift personnel. And the model essentially puts them at station four on air four, which responds to all working fires, but it's a single person staffed vehicle, which gives them ability to respond across the city to support the incident commander, the battalion chief, in the event of a working fire, another call. If there is a secondary incident, this person would um, have some rank and be able to respond at any given time. Additionally, they'll be trained as a fire investigator it's important to start that as quickly as possible, preserve the scene and evidence and call additional resources. And then finally, and probably most importantly, is the ability to have a, the ability to do a fire inspection, code enforcement and complaints that happen on nights and weekends when the regular staff is not here and how to deal with that. What happens when we have fire alarm systems in an occupied hotel or an apartment building and we need some expertise there to deal with uh, issues that may affect life safety and have somebody immediately able to give good advice and uh, provide good customer service. So we hope you'll uh, consider this request again this year. Andy, before you leave that, the general, you got it as, as general fund personnel costs 227000 Would more of that not be in facilities taxes? I mean, I, I'm just asking, is there a vehicle in that? I don't think that includes the vehicle. Those are only the pay, yeah. It's just personnel? Salary and benefits, which is, we cannot assign okay. right. personnel costs to uh, facilities. Yeah. All right, as uh, I said earlier, now we're gonna look at some of our vehicles. Uh, we do have several uh, vehicles that we need to get replaced. Our engine two, it's currently 17 years old. It's on a normal replacement schedule of every t uh, 12 years. So it's getting some age on it and some hours. Uh, we're looking at rotating that into a reserve status uh, if we're approved uh, for this new replacement. Uh, same goes for our battalion truck. It's nine years old. 
our battalion chiefs are on the road every day, 24-7. Uh, so it does get a lot of wear and tear on it, and it does carry quite a quite a bit of resources that is weight intensive. Uh, we're also looking at uh, once again we're going to be requesting the two rapid response units for transport uh, to ensure that we uh, can protect our or, or, t or care for our citizens and visitors of this community. Uh, and then we will replace two additional or asking to replace two additional staff vehicles uh, that are currently. Uh, over their replacement schedule. Some other things we'd like to highlight is our uh, three cardiac monitors. Currently, uh, our towers do not have this capability. In order for us to run ALS tower companies, we, we, we would require the purchase of these three additional cardiac monitors at 115,000 total. We have uh, some other highlights I'd like to go to. Uh, our drone. Uh, this can be something that is a great asset to not only our department but the city as well if the correct drone is purchased. We can get them now with payloads that can be used on fire, hazmat, and uh, traffic uh, accidents. Uh, but we can also use them with the FLIR technology in the event we have uh, people that are lost, especially uh, after hours. Uh, with the infrared technology, we could use that to find um, kids or, or adults who somehow become disoriented. I think you remember a uh, may have seen a news report not long ago where we recently found a uh, a uh, patient of one of the local nursing homes using our thermal imaging camera. Well, what this will do will take it from our height to above, so we can cover more ground in a more uh, efficient manner. And out of this facilities tax, telestaff is going to be our number one uh, request. This is going to allow us to establish a staffing roster that will manage our time off and our uh, uh, sick time as well. When people call in, no longer will it take an individual to try to schedule that, but the system will schedule it with, uh, for us. Uh, and that will save us many man hours. Uh, we've worked diligently with our IT and our human resources department to ensure that this product will work seamlessly with the Kronos. And what we found out is Telestaff is actually owned by Kronos. So this would be a, a good system to employ. We have the full support of uh, both the uh, HR and IT. And we've also taken it to the IT steering committee as well. And last but not least is our uh, request for a fuel truck. Uh, we have a number of generators uh, located throughout the city that can be uh, used during uh, emergency situations. However, they require fuel. Uh, we did put in a grant this year to replace several of the uh, generators with a combination diesel and natural gas. But until that uh, grant's either approved or disapproved, we will have to rely strictly on our diesel uh, and refueling. We do have a contract uh, with our purchasing has a contract with TriStar. However, we don't know what kind of, uh, you know, services that they would be able to provide in an emergency situation. So this would just give us a bit of a hedge fund, if you will. Last year, you asked us to look at what our projections were on a three to five year plan. Um, so we've looked at uh, in the next three to five years adding, adding additional operational staff at 12, um, an additional emergency management staff. In anticipation of our rapid transport units, we're going to add medical director, our special ops battalion chief, and uh, enhancing our training division by adding uh, three EMS uh, and fire trainers. Uh, as far as in our administrative positions, we'll be adding an office manager to manage the day-to-day -day administrative assistance, as well as an accreditation manager as we move forward with our accreditation. So in summary, we strive to, to provide the highest <coughs> level of service. Uh, we look at it as an opportunity to serve those that pay our salaries and that we protect, and we take that very seriously. So in closing, I don't know if Chief would like to close out with anything else. Yes, uh, thank you for listening to us and uh, allowing us to present to you. Um, and we hope that you help us take this in consideration to the full board. 
Thank you. Any questions or comments? Margaret? Is it all right for me to ask some questions? Yes. I have a couple. I did not understand you, uh, Glenn, when you said 80% of our citizens think we were deficient in what? Uh, in uh, disaster preparedness. It was part of the customer service uh, survey. Uh, let me see. We fell into the 80th percentile uh, in the uh, disaster preparedness area. How do they know what we are deficient in? That was part. The, yeah, it was part of a. Is this survey. from the citizen survey? The one, yes. Yeah, I think Let's it was let Michael uh, walk you okay. through that. It, it's not quite 80 percent being dissatisfied. It's actually placing us in the top 20 percent. Oh. So, one of one of the one of the concerns that was raised in in this, if you, I won't say a concern. One of the, the areas within the survey that our citizens responded less favorably to, uh, certainly when looking at their own degrees of emergency preparedness, was uh, are, are, they f are they ready for an emergency? I think oh. we ranked 242nd nationally in terms of, or 212th, I forget the exact number, and be more than happy to get it for you, um, on, on uh, disaster preparedness. Um, that's the that's yeah. Right. So that that I think is the impetus for that request would be to have a new position okay. to assist citizens in you know what needs to be in a in a um, a bug out bag if you will and and how many days of water you need and Living and, and emergency prepare. and okay. Mm -hmm. Then I have another question uh, on vehicles. Yes. What what is a rapid response unit? I got this one. <laughs> Are you home? Yes, sir. <laughs> Ms. Martin, uh, we met with the uh, hospital recently, mm -hmm. and uh, on multiple times, uh, Williamson County EMS uh, has to rely on bringing in additional personnel at peak call times that they cannot answer particular calls within a certain time frame. So when we presented it to the hospital, they thought it was a good idea that we helped and enhanced the county EMS system when it comes to transporting. And we said, once you reach that time, if you would let us know if we have the capabilities in our organization, we would put our units in service to assist them in transports in our area. So. You mean an ambulance? Yes, ma'am. So, so right now we operate, we will send a paramedic out in a large SUV. Right. <clears throat> so it'll have the gear, but it doesn't have any ability to transport. So what the chief and his team has requested is to look at a vehicle that would have the ability to transport if needed. It would still be coordinated with EMS, who would be the primary transport option. But if there's a situation where the time demand or the availability of a EMS ambulance, a county EMS ambulance, was not there that we could go ahead and, and make a transport to help in a certain situation. And so we would need two ambulances? Yes, ma'am. According to the state laws and regulations, you cannot have just one. And this would replace existing equipment that we, we something it's it's a vehicles that are nearing the end of their useful life anyway and this has been an enhanced vehicle that's been requested by the department for us to look at okay. and, and furthermore um, in natural disasters you know we would like to be able to know and coordinate how units are utilized in our community and currently we cannot do that for example, if a tornado come through and clipped Fairview, a portion, a west portion of um, Franklin and part of Brentwood, where are those ambulances going to come from and who's going to manage how they get utilized in our community? And uh, I don't know of a plan for that because we're not allowed to make a plan for that so um, well, are you saying though we would 
operate with the county on this? Absolutely. We All we want to ever do is enhance what they're currently doing mm -hmm. and be a stakeholder in that for them to when they get overloaded, which mm -hmm. all their systems, anybody across the country that runs those types of agencies gets overburdened and overloaded at some point. And so all we're saying is let us help. Let us help when you cannot facilitate getting us an ambulance in 15 <coughs> minutes when we have a critical patient that needs to get to the hospital. Let us help with that endeavor. And because we have the staff, we have the people, we just don't have the state certified vehicle to okay. transport them. Thank you. Follow up on that. Does that mean the county would then reimburse us for that service since we're doing their work? Uh, Mayor, that has never <laughs> taken discussion. <laughs> I, you know, I did have a discussion with them about what that fee would be uh, and said that we would like to see that fee kept low. Um, there's a standard Medicare, Medicaid billing rate. And so that would be a board decision at that point in time once we got those vehicles and entered into that agreement. Um, what they said was they didn't want us to charge less than they're charging because they didn't want us to get in a competitive uh, system with them. And we said, okay. <laughs> so, um, I mean, those are all things to be worked through and worked out. My biggest concern is what do we do when the system is overburdened and we have a citizen or a visitor sitting somewhere in our community waiting 20 minutes on an ambulance and we have paramedics on the scene that could transport them to, to the hospital. Now we know from our previous EMS studies that 50% of all the calls that originate in, within the city limits of Franklin go to Williamson Medical Center. Should be used to that by now, but I'm not. <laughs> Let me introduce our team to you, Paige Cruz, the Assistant Parts Director to my right. Uh, we also have Kevin Lindsay, who is our Facility Superintendent, and Brian Walker, who is our Urban Forestry Superintendent. Um, very appreciative to, to them for assisting with this budget, and you'll hear from them today as well. So, if we may, um, we'll go ahead and start. We'll have, basically, as the other um, departments have already shared, we'll kind of go a little bit through our purpose, our organizational charts, to talk a little bit about our, our revenue and the projections. Uh, we'll cover our base budgets and personnel and operations. We'll also cover the program enhancements and then also a future um, look at some of the outlook of our part system as we've got some CIP projects and other projects that are planned for the upcoming year. So in, next slide please. So basically as each of us talk with the general public, it was always important is when we present to the Citizens Government Academy and even to you all, um, we all are in agreement that quality is more in favorable than quantity. And uh, even though we have over a thousand acres in our park system, it's important that we as a, as a team and uh, our employees, but also that the, the community knows that we have a vision. 
And just quickly is, we pro is to provide high quality accessible parks, historic sites, trails and recreation amenities that will create positive recreational healthy experiences for all residents and visitors of the city that making living, working and playing in Franklin the city of choice for the region. And we truly uh, work toward that, especially when you're in the business of quality of life in our community. So the next slide will kind of, this is as Michael uh, shared already with you all, this is the current organizational chart of the changes in which you saw earlier today as part of this meeting. It includes um, those personnel changes already. And the next slide uh, includes our personnel, uh, the salary and wages of around 3.3 million. We average yearly about 38,000 in overtime. We are requesting about 45 as we see some of the events that are coming down the pipe. One of the things with the events, and you'll hear a little bit about that today, is uh, we don't know where these people come from every time we host an event. We're very fortunate in Franklin that our, many of our events are free, but there are thousands that attend. And so that takes a little bit more time and energy. We're also becoming the, the choice in the region for tournaments and other, um, as Southeast comes on board in the next few years, that'll even grow in our athletics. So we're very, uh, we're proud of that, but at the same time, there also is an impact. We have the current staffing level, as you can see, we have 52 total personnel um, that's within that current organizational chart. Next slide, please. So within our base budget of operations, we're, um, we're asking for an increase of around 4.4%, and the reason for that is, again, um, as we as a public, uh, within the public work sector, we do have a, quite a bit of the repair and maintenance services that we have to upkeep within our, um, within our fleet, and that's just not vehicles, but also of our equipment. The increase of numbers of special events, that is something, but also the repairs for special events. One of the things that we have uh, began to track within the department is anytime you have a tournament or you take a pilgrimage to that's one of our largest events. You have damage uh, on the site or repairs that you have to do. And what we were doing for so many years is, yes, we can, we can charge back to that event uh, as we do, and they pay those things. But there's an impact on the, the operational uh, within the budget. Even though there's a reimbursement, we still have to make those repairs on the front end and then we bill those, those uh, organizations. And so what we're trying to do is just make sure we balance that and working with finance and that team, that we capture that in some way, because that's not a sponsorship or something. We just, it's a reimbursement. We receive them, but there is an impact. And sometimes that shows negatively on the, the operational budget versus just showing that uh, we're even. Next slide is the revenue outlook for 2019. Uh, I broke, we broke this down into three categories. Um, within the revenue is special events and rentals. This is your pavilion rentals. These are your special events that we host. The eastern flank rentals that we do or any um, that we have in the parks at Harlandsdale. Um, so we had 143,000 uh, in that area. Parkland impact fees and now this is not something we usually talk about in general fund, but it's important that we report every year that we do have around 24 million. Those, that uh, area will be allocated through a, as one of the funding sources through our CIP. And so, um, but we did want to mention of what, where we were in the, at the end of 2019 in that fund. There's also lease programs we have with Cowboys, fr Franklin Baseball, different ones that we have around 16,000 in revenue. So that is the revenue outlook. We are projecting around anywhere from four to 5% increase in those areas. Uh, just the same as with parkland as we continue to grow with residential development, that parkland impact fees in those specific quadrants will increase. And that just depends on development. Next slide, please. Thank you. She's ahead of me now. Way to go, Vicki. Um, Michael, oh, well, I think Vicki does a wonderful job at times. Michael's doing great as well. Today it's Michael. 
<laughs> so uh, we have 10 uh, total program enhancement requests, four personnel, one facility renovation that uh, you'll hear about here in a few minutes, four equipment requests, and one playground request. The total requests that we have before you today on all of these are around 558,000. So to, now I'm going to turn this over as we talk about the, um, the program enhancement request that you'll see is I'm going to turn it over to Kevin and Brian, um, and Kevin will start us off on the trails worker and just share a little bit about why we're requesting these personnel changes. Thanks, Lisa, and good afternoon. Um, as you all know, we have just opened up, first time in the city, uh, a mountain bike trail. And um, uh, we had quite a few folks up uh, late last year to uh, welcome that new amenity to the site. And uh, with that, and with some other future uh, endeavors that the city has, we're gonna have a whole lot more trails. So uh, we also have almost uh, 30 bridges within the park system. We've got about 11 miles of park system. We're gonna have a lot more than that coming with the Southeast Park, with Water's Edge, uh, different trail systems. So um, not only will this person go out and make sure all of these trails are looked at, walked. We also have some amenities in the mountain bike trail that uh, are structures that will have to be looked at. We'll play those more or less like a playground safety inspection uh, for the safety fact of those. Um, but this person will go out and make sure uh, all those are intact and ready for play. Um, if there is any downtime for that person, that person then would fall back into the maintenance division. Uh, currently we have three uh, maintenance personnel that's out in the field and one supervisor. And uh, nine times out of 10, that supervisor has to get into the field and work with those guys. Um, and, and sometimes that can be an issue, especially uh, uh, when you've got a job that requires more than one person or someone to hold a ladder or this or that. Um, so we feel like this would be uh, the perfect op opportunity uh, with some of the trails that are coming in the future to go ahead and get this person in, get them trained. Um, we're also, um, the standard, the Mosby at Cool Springs is being sold right now. Uh, because of that, uh, we're reworking the contract and uh, we'll have some uh, monies coming in from that side uh, to also help uh, look at the uh, expense for this person for the next several years. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, partly, uh, or within the Urban Forestry Division currently, uh, we're currently budgeted for two full-time uh, staff members and one part-time. Um, and as I'm, as I want to talk about the uh, enhancement request, I want to talk about the full-time tree worker and the part-time, or the reclassification of the part-time tree worker to a full-time tree worker, because the reasoning really go hand in hand. And, it, and it, what it does, it boils down to, to safety and to our current workload. For our, our, the, our urban forestry division, they work with a, a large, what we call the bucket truck, and they also have a chipper as well. And when you have uh, two full-time uh, staff and a part-time, that means that two days out of the week, they don't have a third person. And so it becomes difficult to uh, do certain jobs uh, when, when, they're, when they are um, in the parks or, or out on the streets. And, and where that comes into as far as from a staffing or from a uh, observing standpoint, uh, as, as when you have just two people, if you have someone who's up in the bucket truck and you have another person on the ground who's hauling debris, we, don't ha we really don't have somebody who's out looking for people uh, walking, walking through, the, uh, through the park. And specifically, believe it or not, people sometimes don't pay attention and they will walk through our job site. So what happens is our staff, as they're working, they, have to, they, have, they really have to really slow down and they have to be much more observant of, what, of what's going on. So um, that's, that's one of the reasons why it, from a, in the parks it's important. Also from a street, when we're doing work on the streets, uh, if we have what we call a, a road job. Uh, now, whenever, when we get on the streets, we have to begin to deal with traffic control uh, vehicles. And so that, that's something that you really, you certainly can't do with just two people. Three people, you can kind of get by, but again, if it's a part-time person, they're not there very often, uh, or uh, they're not there the full time. And so we have to do a lot of scheduling, or we have to uh, work with other departments in order to have some staff come over to help, uh, help uh, with traffic maintenance. Lastly, uh, it, it kind of comes back down to a workload as well. As, as Kevin mentioned, we have new parks that come into play, uh, new, new uh, uh, property uh, that is owned by the city. And, and typically with when we have new parks, new property, that means we have more trees. They, they kind of go hand in hand there. And so w with that, 
uh, we have um, more trees to take care of. And then also one thing that we've been, we've worked with streets department, uh, our urban forestry uh, division, they take care of the trees down here on the square, out through West Main. They also take care of some of the trees that are on the streetscapes along um, uh, Columbia Avenue and Hillsborough Road. And then also the, the last thing we have is we have a lot of service requests that are coming from other departments as well, whether they be uh, water, uh, fire department has requests, SES has requests, and uh, even some from, from uh, Brad Wilson with facilities here in that uh, building, we have, we have work that we've done uh, at, at fire stations or future fire stations. So those are some of the reasons why we're looking towards uh, needing some additional help with, uh, with uh, our urban forestry staff. Sure. Yes, as far as the, our part-time landscape worker, um, again, uh, over the last few years, we, we've taken on more parks uh, within the city. Uh, some of those are the Bicentennial uh, area, the Point Park, the Old Liberty Neighborhood Park, and even in, in some of our older established parks, uh, Eastern Flank, we have certain areas that are require higher levels of maintenance. And so therefore, when you have those higher levels of maintenance and you have more stuff to take care of, that's where we need more personnel. Last year, we were fortunate enough to have a crew chief come on board to our landscape uh, division. That helped tremendously. But, what we've, but even with that, uh, it, we, we find that it doesn't take as long to recover as far as our high season, our springs, and, and, and making repairs after events. It takes a little bit longer to recover from that. And so what we're seeing is, is that from a part-time standpoint, we believe that part-time person will be able to help us get to the level that we not only we need to be, but it'll also allow us to start to get ahead of things a little bit to where we can begin to do more of the de details to, to make overall enhancements within our park system. Thank you, Kevin and Brian. So the next slide just kind of shares a little bit of the, the program enhancements they just described in those personnel. As you saw the current, this is what the proposed would look like and underneath those uh, divisions in which they would be housed. So we're now gonna go straight into, uh, from the program enhancement into the facility section. Um, I'm gonna ask Kevin and maybe Paige to kind of tag team on this one. This is Eastern Flank. As you remember, that this was the old country club and um, a lot of golf balls uh, were, were hit in this area. Unfortunately, not everyone's as great of a golfer as the mayor is um, and hit the building quite a bit. And so uh, we've done a lot of work, and as all of you have been inside that facility, we've done 98% uh, of the work internally, whether it's internal in th the facility itself or externally on the grounds. Um, however, we need some uh, additional assistance. So this total project here is around $200,000. There would be around 186,000 toward this renovation. And uh, we will start with around uh, fourteen to fifteen thousand dollars with uh, additional landscaping because this would have to be taken out. Would you mind sharing a little bit about what would entail? Sure, sure. Um, one of the overlying questions, though, Mayor, is one of those holes in the side of the building your golf ball hole by chance back in the day? Would that be? Yes? I didn't live here then. Didn't oh, okay. <laughs> Ooh, escape that. One. Even I, Got lucky on that one, Mayor. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, the, the building, uh, as you know, we have made quite a few changes and upgrades to the inside of the building uh, over the past years. And this has truly become one of our go-to rental facilities and is highly sought after at this time. Um, the outside of the building is a drive-it stucco type system. It has been on there for many, many years, I guess, as long as the building has been there. It's been added onto uh, several different times. And um, to go in to repair some of the 60 plus holes that's just on the east side of the building, um, you're talking about a little bit of money and, and then you have the aesthetics that, that go in with that. So uh, it, it's really not feasible to go in just to redo the outside of the building or restucco the outside. You're gonna spend quite a bit of money there. And with us not knowing what's on the inside of that drive, it, as you know, it's temperamental, uh, it gets moisture behind it. It's not the best scenario, I don't think, for our region. Um, people are moving away from that. Uh, so we like to go ahead and remove that all the way down to the studs, uh, come back with a, uh, a hardy type or a cement uh, lap siding board uh, that, that would look very similar to the Fleming Center so that we kind of tie into that area. Um, a lot of folks don't know that we don't own the Fleming Center and once you pull onto the property, you think it's all just one property with uh, you know, a, a very historic cemetery there. But uh, uh, 
but anyway, it would look very similar to that. Um, some of that money would be used to the outside uh, to reduce some of the landscaping and to put irrigation in. That would be under Brian's uh, call there. Uh, but with taking all that infrastructure off the outside of that or all, all the, 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 the EFIS, uh, it will destroy what's around that. So we will have to go back in and replant those uh, plant materials to make it look uh, more appropriate. I just wanted to add that um, this last year we reached uh, over 40,000 in revenue, which was our highest ever since 16. Uh, many of you have seen the inside of that building before all the renovations started. Uh, a lot of that was done internally. Some of Kevin's team, Brian's team has done a lot on the outside of that building. Uh, and basically, um, we want that outside to match that inside. And if you're a renter, that's important when you're taking pictures. Um, and if you, from afar, it looks okay, but when you get close, you can see those, exactly what Kevin described. Uh, so that is a concern of ours as we move forward and try to increase that number some more with revenue. And this next one that is up here is uh, simply to replace uh, a replacement for a compact utility tractor. Uh, this is uh, mainly been requested by our athletics, but it can be used by our entire team. As you see, the one to the left is an existing piece of equipment, and I'm not quite sure how old it is, but it's older than me. Uh, I've been here about 11 and a half years. Uh, may have started when Lisa did. I'm not sure. Uh, we don't know. We love it, but it's not that functional anymore. So we can't. We're looking at functionality. She's <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. Uh, we don't know. It just kind of inherently became athletics one day. So uh, we do want something that we can use more with our attachments for airifying, verticutting, things like that. And again, this can be used beyond athletics on Brian's side with special events at Harlansdale and Eastern Flank and some other areas. Uh, so it's basically replacing that tractor. Uh, next is a, uh, a mini excavator. Uh, it would be a new, a new piece of equipment for us. Um, over the last several years, uh, we've slowly been uh, using this type of piece of equipment a little bit uh, more each year. Uh, typically, we were borrowed at a total of 19 days, uh, and then we had there were 11 additional days where we probably could have borrowed it, but we we may do uh, on a particular project. Uh, but what we what we would use our landscape project, those are all the things that we used it for in the last year. And one of the things that we, what we're seeing is just more, a, a greater and greater need for a, a specialized piece of equipment, but it's, some, it's a piece of equipment that can be used throughout the department in, in all of our various divisions. And the next piece of equipment you see uh, we're requesting is a new piece of equipment. Uh, Let's this show the video, if you don't mind. If we're going to get, Vicki's going to take over. Just while she's <laughs> describing this, this was, took place this year at Jim Warren. This was right after uh, lacrosse season, and lacrosse is from February through uh, May, and then we go straight into football. And you can kind of look and see the imprint of the field. And, uh, and actually police did this video for me, so that's why I'm talking, no music. But you can kind of see, uh, <laughs> but thanks to police. It is very impactful. If you can see, um, that is one of our, we contracted that service, and that's the blue machine there is that contractor. We're on the other side. That's our staff in the orange Kubota with the dump trailer. Um, and you see that thatch coming off of there, and you may say, um, you know, we did demo this before uh, last year. We kind of did the most we've ever done, over 35000 uh, we did spend on this, which we could have purchased one. Uh, this is kind of separate. Uh, it's a different kind of way to do, I would say, a renovation. We, in the past, did a lot of top dressing. Uh, we're seeing a lot of results from this. Other cities, mainly colleges, and even at the higher level, are using this piece of equipment. Uh, and we saw a great impact from it last year. Uh, we use it for baseball too. You can use it for basically any area uh, where you have uh, like irrigation. You have to stay off of it four to six weeks after. And a lot of that material there can be taken to the compost uh, or either repurposed if you got areas that you need to grow back inside. So it's uh, been very, very, very beneficial for us. And again, we spent as much as we spent last year after we really got to using it, we decided we loved it and backed off a of top dressing and went this route. Uh, and seen great success this past year with it. 
and this is, I think, me again, uh, so I'll just keep going. Uh, this is requesting a new uh, piece of equipment. Uh, this is a new trimming rotary mower, and this is just to add to our current fleet. Uh, we don't use real mowers, we use these. Uh, it does a very similar job and a little bit easier on the maintenance side. Uh, so as we grow, we're trying to do less um, rotary, less um, zero turns and more of this type just to get that finer, tighter um, look, with, especially with baseball fields and football. So we're just requesting an additional new mower. This next request is a program enhancement for Pinkerton Park. Uh, this is for outside Tinkerbell, uh, mainly down toward the north side of the park. We've got several pieces of playground equipment down there that has seen its better days. Uh, some of that is definitely older than Lisa uh, when they come into play, um, but uh, it does look better than the tractor. But, uh, but anyway, uh, with us removing some of those pieces of equipment, uh, we're able to go back in and put in something like you see in the picture there that can more or less be suitable for all ages and even uh, uh, even seniors, uh, you know, trying to get their balance back and that sort of thing. So uh, we feel like this would be a very uh, good uh, update to Pinkerton uh, with also safety in mind. Lisa. <laughs> I started here when I was 12. You remember that, right? You, you hired me. I, I, I interviewed you. Yes, you did. <laughs> she had to get a note from her mother to take the interview. Right. And, so, and some of that playground equipment was there. That's, right. that's why it's time she we does, got to get she rid of it. On. <laughs> that's why I was so good. Humpty put that playground yes, yes, in. Yes, he did. It probably has some historical significance. It probably yeah. does. <laughs> Could be. And it's it, time to replace. It's, 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 it's better time. <laughs> Mr. Chadwell left me a, a long list, and that was some of the things that he left. But he <laughs> left a great legacy, that's for sure. So now, as it gets turned, and thank you, team, for sharing, um, because those in program enhancements, it, it continues to allow us to do some of the things day to day, enhance our day to day with our staff and our teams. But let's talk a little bit about the future growth. And I won't spend lots of time, but it was uh, asked of us to what, what does the next three to five years kind of look like? And so these are some of the areas in which I will just shortly go over, please. So with Bicentennial, we, uh, this will be at the next board meeting. We brought this before the CIC um, uh, last month. And so it's time, we'll probably, we'll probably keep the name for now. But yes, it is as old as me too, this is the Bicentennial. Um, but it also shows as we continue, as we have the discussion regarding the floodway and what the parking looks like, but it's real important to understand that moving forward with this facility, this park in this area for events in our downtown, having parking for the bus parking for our tourism is very important to be able to house here. But it also shows that anytime we add something, you're also adding personnel and equipment in those divisions. Please. Southeast. Uh, is moving right along, we're working with engineering, and I have to give kudos to engineering. They've assigned us an engineer within our department now, and it's been wonderful to work with all of them. Um, but as they kind of uh, oversee these projects with us, we're about 60% designed with the bridge for the Southeast complex area. Um, we are, the park is under design for the, the five uh, football fields that will be going in as well as the inclusive playground, the trails, and that type of thing. Robertson Lake's included in this. We also have a professional service agreement with that consultant of looking at the dam and what the, it will be to restore the dam in order to make this area safe for the general public to use. So this is 233 acres, and we do see that uh, over the next five to six years, there will be an impact in personnel, and of course, there'll be an impact for equipment on this side of town. Uh, next slide is Liberty Park. You approved this Tuesday night to begin uh, list, uh, to redo this master plan that was completed about 10 years ago. Uh, we will redo the design. It will include tennis courts and pickleball, a farmer's market shed because now we have a farmer's market twice a week on the property, pavilions, uh, cricket is one of those new sports that we'll be looking at practice facilities for those folks for children and adults, public restrooms, and of course, extending the mountain biking trail system. Next slide. 
the park at Harlan Stale, um, we are hoping to have a, um, we're working on a scope of services right now for the main barn. This is a partnership we're having with Friends of Franklin Parks to uh, include some of the funding which they've raised publicly for the barn. Um, so we hope to bring that before you in March. But over the next five to seven years, not only would you look at the barn, we're also looking at his, um, restoring the, hay, the historic Hayes home, the worker houses, and maybe working on the design or understanding what would be included in the powerhouse. And hopefully that we would have some public-private partnerships to assist with those projects. The next slide is the additional trails and facilities. So some of this that's included in the picture includes what the overall mountain biking trail system, which would be anywhere from five to six miles, depending on how we out the outline of that particular project. You also have here is the, um, the riser point and the fields at Reese. Uh, as those projects come through, you also have the new Mac catcher. So that will make a large connection over a mile long with those residents. But that is something in which we have easements or uh, it will be under construction for a trail system there with the parkland impact fees. And we're also under design with engineering is to extend the Aspen Grove Trail all the way to Matt Catcher. That's a connection that's missing right now and that is under design. So that kind of gives you a look of what, um, I did not put my picture up here because <laughs> you can hear how my staff treats me. Um, but they are, um, and Suzanne really must want some kudos because she's in here twice. Yeah, but why is she not in that third one? I we know, work on that. I know. They, she was <laughs> she there. <laughs> Quite a few awards that we've won. Uh, there's so many accolades that our team has received this past year. But um, we're very fortunate in what we do. We're exciting about what we do. We're passionate about it. And uh, I hope that you can see that. But as far as the budget, please, we welcome any questions or uh, comments you may have at this time. My only question is, once Aspen Grove gets connected there, will you be able to go all the way south to 96? Is, is Correct. That so once that connection is, that's a great question. So once you connect to, from Aspen Grove, that last piece, then you can hit the mat catcher and go all the way to Pinkerton if you would continue around the loop. And then we will work uh, you can continue toward Harlandsdale, toward Franklin Road, and the new sections is where we will have a small gap, but we'll be working to make those. The goal is that at some point in time then is you will have a full connection all the way where the new Mac Catcher section is going in. We'll have to do some improvements at Harlandsdale of making some small connections if you were to come internally but we can get you all the way to Harlandsdale. So once this connection is made, you could actually walk or bike from the downtown area if you wanted to go with the trail systems. And that's the goal. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Fairview Middle School Boys Basketball is in action tomorrow night <laughs> uh -oh. at Blackman Middle School. Uh, we have made it to the Final Four, and uh, whether we show up or not, we're going to get a fourth-place trophy, but <laughs> my guys are, are, are going at the, at, at the bit. Uh, we play at 7:15. Win or lose, we'll play Saturday at Stewart's Creek High School or Middle School for first, second, or third or fourth place. So now I'm the assistant coach. Will Hotch is the head coach, uh, and right now we're 27 and 1. Wow. So it's a first That's for Fairview good. Middle School. So. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Exciting times. <laughs> Item 11. Presentation of Sanitation and Environmental Services Fund. We've got a guy. I have one. Oh, nothing. You, fine. First off, I want to thank everyone here for your time and also for your uh, endorsements over the years since I've been 
involved with the Sanitation and Environmental Service Department. I'm really here to present a budget, but also to brag a little bit about what we do, because we do quite a bit. Um, going right on into the operational transition status, which is basically a lot of things that we've undertaken this, this fiscal year. Um, and, and most of it we had to have your vote of confidence on to pursue. We did receive our air permit for the yard waste air burner from TDEC. The air burner was delivered in January and we're waiting electrical hookup because it's electric motor uh, apparatus. And we're looking very forward to getting that operational very soon. Uh, at the time of this writing, we had 10,450 registered Blue Bend customers uh, registered. Uh, and 8,500 blue bins have been delivered by SES. And I can't understate uh, how much work went involved, uh, was involved with, with getting this accomplished because we did this with our own staff. We had to receive the tractor tray loads of carts. We had to physically unload them. We had to hammer wheels and uh, uh, attach bags and reload them in the delivery vehicles and then deliver them. Uh, I'm very thankful for a dedicated staff uh, that have enjoyed taking on this project and, and I'm very proud of all of them. We're, we're really ahead of schedule uh, and I expect we'll have everybody that's registered delivered within two weeks. Yes, so we're already in yep. phase two of the delivery, so we're, we're well up here the schedule. The highest day that they had for deliveries was 622 in one day, and that's, that's pretty much cranking them out and getting it done. So those guys are, we all coming in, all we see is blue bins now. So. <laughs> and, and a key component of that has been our routing system. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I want to emphasize that because we've, it's part of our uh, budget presentation later on in personnel. Everything, our department lives, breathes on routing now. Uh, it, it's one of our most mm -hmm. important functions that we have in maintaining our, our systems, keeping routes reorganized. We redo our routes pretty often to keep them optimized, <coughs> make sure we're uh, getting the most for our money, mm -hmm. uh, and we do. We were able to remove three rear loading trucks from routes by optimi optimizing our yard waste collection. Uh, we had dual compartment rear load trucks that were out picking up ground trash and brown bags. And I uh, never really understood it, but we that's the way it was set up, but we, we have since gone to combining our brown bags and yard waste brush with the knuckle boom trucks, mm -hmm. and it takes out a lot of the physical part of what we were doing. Um, and my goal has been always to automate anything we can automate to cut down on worker injuries, because that's our number one uh, issue in this industry, actually. And I will say that solid waste is always in the top five of the national most dangerous jobs. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't realize that. But it, it's, if you ever get on the back of a truck and run the downtown route <laughs> in Franklin, <laughs> you'll, you'll understand. <laughs> um, we discontinued the commercial dumpster service. Uh, which removed two front-loading trucks from service. We sold five pieces of equipment to date, totaling $348,000. Um, actually, since March of 2019, with three more pieces of equipment, we hope to sell for an estimated $350,000, maybe more, before the end of the fiscal year. And a big chunk of that is, is getting the air burner operational and approved by the state with our... Uh, 
uh, first pass and uh, get that grinder sold. And of course, everybody knows the purpose of our department is to provide sanitation service directly related to quality of life for residents, business, visitors, and the community in an environmentally responsible, safe, efficient manner while being good stewards of our resources. And we'll always continue to provide <coughs> current services focusing on increased efficiency in all divisions of the department. I can sit here today and tell you that the city of Franklin has, if not the best, somebody would have to show me a better uh, sanitation department anywhere in the United States. And I've been to a lot of them and visited them. And it's important to remember, I think one of the things that we're all proudest of is when we do the citizen survey, and it's, it's in the budget, 91% yeah. of Franklin residents rate sanitation collection as excellent or good. It's one of our highest rated departments. And I can tell you one of the key components of that has been city administration and elected officials foresight years ago into trying to separate this out of a general fund um, funded operation. Uh, we're right on, we're all over being self-funded and we're at a rate that's would be envious to anywhere in America uh, for the amount of service that we provide. Because I've participated in programs where you relied totally on the general fund. And I'd be sitting here and I've sat in front of 40 some odd councilmen in Nashville at the very end of all of the presentations to try to explain why we needed new garbage trucks. And you know we couldn't compete with fire schools police, everything else. It was like the bottom bung of the ladder. It, and we rarely got anything. Um, but I was fortunate to have one good mayor before I left and we did <laughs> do a lot of, we, we did a lot of good, good things. <laughs> um, in our organizational chart, uh, what what happened with this, there's actually an error in our last year's uh, chart. We we failed to keep the, there was actually four SES crew supervisors. We kept one position open uh, with the intent to test the waters that we could reduce that staff to three and continue the level of service. And we've successfully done that, but we want to keep that position. It, it is funded, but we're changing that uh, to a, uh, another route analysis, which is key to what we, we do. And, and Nate will get into that here in just a minute. Mm -hmm. Our base budget request in personnel In 2020 was 3.392 million. 2021 is 3.487 million, a uh, difference of 95,000 or 2.8%. And it's basically an increase in medical premium pensions assessments. Um, we haven't added any staff or made any changes. Base budget request operations 2020 was 6.2 million. 2021 would be 5.8 million, and I'm rounding numbers. The difference of 474,000 <coughs> or negative 7.6%, and this was due to the one time cost of purchasing the blue bins, uh, which we will recoup uh, that money over, but it's going to take over the next year. 12 months um, to get that money back. And I'm going to turn it over to Nate now to go a little bit more in depth with our program enhancement request. I'd say good afternoon to uh, everyone. Um, they always say um, 
being a solid waste worker is not a glamorous job, but it's a necessary job. And I'm proud to say that uh, I keep the city of Franklin clean. So this is this is a great opportunity. And I thank you guys for just listening to us um, and um, taking this into uh, consideration. Um, this year for the 2021 budget, we have eight program enhancements that we're asking for, uh, totaling over 1.1 million. Um, with the personnel coming in at over 24,000, um, operations is at 40,000, and in that 40,000, we're requesting for educational purpose for the blue beans and um, everything that we do as far as recycling, trying to get the word out to the, the citizens of Franklin. Then you have your equipment that's just a little over a million dollars. A lot of times you'd be like, why do you need a million dollars worth of equipment? Um, we actually serviced over 2.2 million, um, had two, over 2.2 million service points um, over the fiscal year. So they see us every day, all day. At some point in time, we touch every corner of Franklin during the week. Um, also associated with that, um, we had uh, anticipated revenue associated with over 160,000 with surplus sales of equipment that we no longer need or, or it's time or it's, it is a uh, lived this life cycle. Um, going on into the personnel request, request Ms. we have two. Um, the reclassification of the technical sports specialist to a routing um, operations analyst uh, is required because of the growth with the city of Franklin. Right now, we currently have one technical support specialist doing the work of probably actually five people. So we're trying to grow that area of our department to make it a little bit more efficient. It will definitely help with getting out routing reports, uh, making updates. Um, it will definitely cut back on some of the overtime that is being created for weekends or trying to work from home and do routing updates. Um, that's going to impact the budget or increase it over $4,000 just to change that position or the reclassification of that position. Before you move, let me add one little thing to that. Uh, this is our routing guru, mm -hmm. is what I call him. Uh, it's really, this is just to place him in a job title and function that he actually is. I can tell you that uh, when I came to the city, uh, there was uh, the title was created as a technical sports specialist, which is doesn't fit the position and the credentials you need to be able to do that position. Uh, this is really just to get that position in the right place at the right pay grade. It just moves it up one pay grade and, and makes it where it should have been all along. All right, moving on with the second enhancement, it's the reclassification of our crew supervisors. Um, you heard Jack early, he said we downgraded to three supervisors and it's working out pretty good, but we wanted to up their pay to make it equivalent with the crew supervisors in the street department. With them being all public works workers, we wanted the, the pay grade to be even and the same because they perform some of the same job duties or similar job duties. That's going to hit the budget in the amount of over 16000 with just the minimum changes um, within that pay grade. And this is another one that I take responsibility for missing back. If y'all remember, we reclassified our, our driver operators to equipment operators to get them equivalent with other public works equipment operators. We were the lower classification. We did that year or two ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I, I didn't never, had never even brought to my attention that other supervisors in other departments were at a higher grade level. Uh, but I figured that out and, and we want to make this right either uh, through a vote of your confidence or I'm confident we can uh, work it through the new pay study if we, mm -hmm. if we need to. So. All right, we're moving on to the next slide. Um, program enhancements for our equipment. We're requesting five enhancements totaling just over one million, like I said before. Um, in that request, we're requesting two side loaders. We're saying we're placing, we're hoping we can make one of those an ad. Um, we're actually, those two units are over six years old. Useful life of one of those units is five years. If we can get six to seven to eight years out of it, that's good, but you want to start replacing it before your repairs become um, more than the truck is actually worth. Um, we actually 
um, also want to add an administrative vehicle. Um, the current administrative vehicle will move to other admin staff to make it a little bit easier to move um, employees around the city as far as going to pick up equipment, um, getting to meetings. We're not trying to make sure we're getting back to the shop so somebody else can take the unit and uh, go somewhere else with it. But we definitely want to add that on uh, with our growing admin. Yeah, we, we have a lot of people that use their personal vehicles. And I personally would prefer them to be in a city vehicle conducting city business. And then actually um, with replacing a knuckle boom, 2011 knuckle boom, um, we definitely need this with our services um, because we're moving over everything from ground trash to the knuckle boom. It's a more efficient unit. You have one man, uh, one truck. It's going to cut down on labor costs. It's going to cut down on um, injuries and claims, especially with our new brown bags being put in with our uh, brush now and um, within the use of our new burner. So we want to make sure we replace this unit and um, help with our new calling service as far as our bulky items and white goods, but this unit will be more efficient. Um, and then also the, the last part of it, um, replacing the mini packer. This is very essential. We know it's 155,000, but this unit has over 80,000 miles on it. We use this unit to get into the alleys of the city of Franklin, um, help with special pickup as far as backdoor services with our long driveways. Uh, we want to make sure we can continue to provide that service. And then uh, also actually you it's, uh, it's also going to be needed for the blue bin back door mm -hmm. uh, that we have to do now. So and the summary. Um, with the transition of our various services and, and all the transitions that we're making this year and the conversion from our blue bags to our blue bins to try to make the service more efficient. Uh, we want to continue to strive toward being a self-sustaining fund um, for the city of Franklin. Uh, we made great strides to do that, um, and we thank y'all for y'all continued support um, in helping us get to a sustainable point. Um, we want to let you know that staff will continue to research additional revenue um, avenues and uh, program enhancements as we do daily. We try to make it the best way, make it easy as possible. Um, and then staff will continue to concentrate our efforts to maximize maximize the efficiency and focus on providing safe and efficient trash and recycling service uh, for the citizens of Franklin. Thank you for your time and attention. Any questions? <coughs> Any questions from anyone? I, I just want to say that those of us who have blue bins now need to be educated on exactly <laughs> what can go in them and what can't. I appreciate the little bag and everything. Yes, in fact, Someone in my household today said, what are you looking at on there? And I said, it's got to be a one or two <laughs> and not a yes, five or eight or something. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, I, I think it would be very helpful to have, you know, and I think it was mentioned up in the front about, you know, I can understand that you can't take the bags from the uh, grocery store. And some of us mm -hmm. are trying to be very good about not bringing any of those home. But... On some other plastic stuff, I mean, you know, plastic wraps, I had thought something heavier plastic than that would be okay to put in, but then I, see, I, that, it's, that's it's what a, I was told. It's the days we live in, and, and but, I will give y'all a quick But update. really, if we, could, if we could have a little, you know, this moment, educational, uh, educational yeah. video yeah, or something, that's why it would we really do have yeah. monies requesting in a program enhancement to continue the education is yes, the key exactly. to recycling. and. And you can't do enough of it. Uh, unfortunately, halfway into deliveries, we ran out of the bags, and guess where they come from? China. <laughs> and guess what? You can't find a manufacturer in the United States to get uh, uh, a, ba a bag like that. So it's all delayed due to the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know where we stopped, and... <coughs> As soon as we get them, we'll deliver them to those customers that didn't get them. It's just we got caught in an unfortunate circumstance. Mm -hmm. but we, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. we do try to keep communicating it mm -hmm. in different ways. You, you see they're on the bin itself, they're the bags that were provided. We've even done some uh, short videos. Mm -hmm. um, 
Robert Mott, who works in our communications, started his hand modeling career with one that is a <laughs> thumbs up or thumbs down oh, about what good. goes in the blue okay. bin. So it's tell just us like a minute and a half video. Yes. <laughs> and where so we available. try to do those kind of things to get out to people to get the message. But, and we get started, we're, this is about the season we start going back into schools, mm -hmm. and we'll be going in with blue bin instead of buddy. Uh, but we've got some creative ideas on on using that tool while we're in the schools. We've and one of them has to several, do with what yeah, you just said. Yeah. We're going to have a trash can and a blue mm -hmm. bin and have some samples on the tables for kids to come up and pick which one it's supposed to go in. and. Yeah, and stu it's simple stuff like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. We'll, do a, we'll do a BOMA meeting session yeah. for everybody. Hey, and believe it or not, I have, uh, I have employees who are pretty, pretty shy guys. They like to stay behind the scenes, but they're actually coming up with ideas that we need to do this and we need to yeah. do that. So I was like, I'm, I'm thanking them for volunteering to be in these videos, and they kind of look at me like, oh, no. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, you know, we've had a, a couple of complaints uh, well, I've heard three. The first one was, how do I get the bag off the cart? The second <laughs> one was uh, somebody that took it and, and decided she just thought it took up too much room in her garage, so we retrieved it. And the, uh, the third one was uh, we've, we, we've ordered them right in the middle of winter, and they're plastic mold. Uh, so the lids, until they start heating up and all, they're not going to be all of them flush. So we've had two or three people call want a new lid because it didn't sit flush, and we have to explain <laughs> to them, give it some time. It will, <laughs> when, when it, spring gets here and over time, it will settle and, and close properly. But overall, uh, we've had minimal, minimal issues, and I'm very proud of it. The yeah, guys and girls in our staff that get it done. <laughs> 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 I had to go through my whole garbage. <laughs> Sort it out. <laughs> <laughs> we can send you the thumbs up and thumbs down video. <laughs> hey, tell us where that is, really and truly. It, we did. It's on uh, Facebook, social media. We mm -hmm. put it on there, and it okay. just got a little music, and it plays over that. So okay. we'll. I think it should be there too. Yeah, we're, we're updating on the it too. Page, yeah. I, I yeah. didn't see that. So yes, I, I. Well, let's say several people may need to look at. That. Yeah, and, and it, you can't communicate enough. Uh, unfortunately, the recycling market has shifted pretty dramatically in the last couple mm -hmm. years, so it is just not as receptive to the different it, things you can take. At one point, we used to say, yeah, we can take about everything, put it in there, and now we have to be much more focused on saying the mm -hmm. ones and twos in plastic and all those, and if the market comes back around, the good news is we have the flexibility to accommodate mm -hmm. it, um, but uh, right now we just need to focus on those key ones yeah, that it, the market will take. It, and part of the problem is from the old days of it looks recyclable, <laughs> throw it in there. It, right. it, yeah. oh, yeah. And in fact, it never was, it, it, and that's where your contamination comes in. The bags are horrible. They, they just bind up any automated system that tries to sort this stuff out. And, I can tell you it's going to be three to five years before we even get to a point of hopefully some kind of stability in this market. Mm -hmm. uh, the irony is that China, who stopped it, is now coming to the U.S. and buying up old paper mills because they need to pulp to make our products that they've got to ship back to us. <laughs> And it's, it's just, it's amazing. Uh, but that's going to take three to five years for those plants to come online and open up some more markets for, for recycling. Yes, ma'am. I, I saw an article in the Tennessee this morning where the, there's a bill going through the state legislature to eliminate Kroger plastic bags, public plastic mm -hmm. bags, you will have to be using recycle or some sort of recycled bag that you did, that you provide yourself. You could buy it, mm -hmm. but uh, so that's that is eventually I suspect going well, away. A, a lot of a lot of cities in the United States are banning them. Yep. Period. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, two, I have no problem. Uh, I still see in some 
some neighborhoods, both the blue bag and the recycled bin out. Yep, and and they don't have till March 28th, uh, and we've made that message clear that if it's not in the bin, it doesn't get picked up. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And uh, and we've done that mainly to give people time that didn't get their bin ordered mm -hmm. to still participate until we can get them a bin. And you know we've we've given a lot of time for for people to get on board and get their bin. And they and we've gotten a lot of registrations when we start delivering. Yeah, that's helpful. Uh, so so how are you handling the blue bags? And are you? They didn't we're, we're, actually, blue no, we're, we're still no, we're taking actually, them. We're still I'm not saying up. you're taking them, but are you opening them up? No, you, no sir, no. not this time around. Um, we're actually taking them to Lewisburg because they're still accepting them like that, and they know our deadline. Um, the best part about this system is we've already put an automated truck on one of the half routes. We already have a side loader that's running out there picking up. I saw it in my neighborhood things. on Monday morning. <laughs> so we, we that, was, definitely, that was pure coincidence. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it's working out great. We just we were tracking great. him over a two-hour period. He picked up over 200 containers with just him in that truck. So taking those people off the street, taking that labor off, and, and reducing that labor cost is going to be a big thing for us this year and moving forward. And... and over the seven years since I've been here, I, I may have been the last additional employee hired in our department. You know, we haven't added people, but we've increased our service, increased the level of service, mm -hmm. and increased the number of homes we've serviced. Uh, so I think that's a big deal, and and we're very proud of it, and we're very thankful that that, that we get the support from, from the board and city administration. Any other questions or comments? Then let's go to budget presentation, elected officials, and administration. All right, I will take that on. We'll go ahead and pull that one up. Um, we'll start with uh, talking about the elected officials, touch on administration, and go through the basics. There's not a whole lot to add here. It's a pretty much status quo budget, but as you know, uh, you are the elected leaders of this community. You connect uh, the citizens' desires and their, their need for representation to charting a course for the community and uh, you know, adopting budgets and policies and ordinances that help us operate and serve the needs of the community. So um, you know, we, we know that's what that's all about, comprised of uh, a mayor elected at large, four aldermen elected at large, and four within the wards. Um, you see the basic structure there, and our budget itself is a, a reduction this year because we don't have an election this year. That's essentially it. Um, otherwise, it's, it's a, a status quo type of budget. Um, I'll go ahead and trans transition right into the administration. Uh, our administration area works closely with the board to uh, articulate and, and drive the, the vision and strategic direction of our city, as well as uh, oversee the day-to-day -day operations of our city team. Uh, and we have a great group that does that, and you see our org chart that, that uh, lays out that, uh, that group. Um, our budget also is pretty much status quo uh, as it uh, continues on. Um, our staffing is the same. We've got some numbers that adjust, and actually you'll see this throughout the budgets. We've worked to significantly refine and update the assumptions we make on pension and health insurance, and Angelique is out there. She did a lot of that work, right? And <laughs> we're appreciative of that, so you will see that uh, reflected in every budget you see is really a, a a, a significant review and update to make sure those are accurate. And that, uh, when you see personnel numbers change on the base budget, that's probably why, because we've refined that and it's a little more accurate. Some places it goes up a little bit, some places it might go down a little bit, uh, just as we get more uh, accurate there. Just a couple program enhancements that are be con being considered uh, in the um, administration area. One is a reclassification 
of an administrative secretary to administrative assistant to reflect some additional duties there and responsibilities uh, involved in that. And then we are looking at um, the potential of adding some furniture out to the area outside this boardroom um, that would provide uh, maybe some more of a welcoming area to, to our citizens and create sort of a um, gathering place for folks to, to, to be out there, whether it's citizens or our own city team members. Um, we might even be able to work a little bit with the um, Convention and Visitors Bureau on that because they're doing a rehab of their existing visitor center and might need to temporarily use this space. So we might work with them on getting some, uh, some of that uh, in partnership with them to provide uh, a more welcoming area to the public out there as they work to rehab their visitor center. Um, again, as it summarizes here, uh, we work together uh, to oversee the day-to-day -day operations, the leadership of our team and, and the strategic management and direction uh, that we see, and we focus on these five key principles. Uh, you see the banners in the hallway. Every city team member is evaluated on these five qualities now. We look at excellence, innovation, teamwork, integrity, and being action-oriented. Uh, so that gives you the overview. Again, the budgets are, are status quo within both uh, administration and in the elected officials. So glad to take any questions you have about your budget. <laughs> any questions? If not, let's go to item 13, budget <laughs> presentation communications. All right, I'll go ahead and kick that off. Monique's going to help me out. Unfortunately, Melissa cannot be here today. She's got a sick child at home. So, uh, uh, we will fill in with that, and, and Monique does a great job working as part of our communication team. So um, we haven't really rehearsed this. We so <laughs> you're going to see us kind of walk through it. I'll let you walk through it, and yeah. I'll jump in where you want me to. Well, you guys know the communications division started in 2008, and um, our main mission is to develop internal and external communications and citizen participation initiatives. And we also manage all of our social media channels and Franklin TV. Um, the org chart, we're not going to have any changes for this year. Uh, Melissa is our communications manager. Um, Gavin is our new social and digital media producer. Uh, Robert is the cable TV production operations supervisor. I'm a public outreach specialist. And Carter is our new cable TV production assistant who's doing part-time work. Um, and it probably was one of the biggest things I think we went through last year. We had a lot of turnover for our small division. We lost three people. but. Um, well, one, I guess, got reassigned, yeah. but he's still with us. So that's kind of been a little bit of a challenge for us, but it's been great, and they've been great, and we're doing some great things now. Um, we don't have any new requests for personnel or base budget operations. Everything's staying the same. Um, I think it looks like we're actually less, right? Let me take a moment to reintroduce you to a budgeting technique. Um, you're going to see in this de department, and actually, you, in, through uh, the departments you just saw and uh, through the departments you will see for the rest of the day, um, there, there are two numbers shown there under, under operations. Um, and I just want to flag this. We charge back to our, um, our enterprise funds, if you will, um, or are more like enterprise funds than not. So stormwater, water management, and sanitation. Uh, a percentage of the relative costs of the administrative support departments. So it, the, the actual operations budget for communications is forecast to be $141,000 this year, but the net, which is shown, is 37491 And there's a, a charge, you'll note, at the bottom of the detail of the budget pages for each of these departments where this applies, that is a negative number that reduces the budget, which is why in some departments, your operations budgets are even negatives because the amount of time that they spend assisting those departments um, outweighs the amount of, of expenses that they may have. Just to explain those two numbers. Um, on the next page, you can see some of the things that we did for 2019. As we've already mentioned, we work with sanitation to promote and build signups for the blue, blue bins. And, and I just sent you a link to that video page that's on our website. So. <laughs> Um, we had a wonderful tree lighting with over 6,000 people, and Kathy Lee, of course, MC, she was great. Um, and the broadcast on Facebook reached almost 19,000 people in 10 different states, which was pretty amazing, we thought. Um, we have a wonderful special events team. 
Um, we really do. They're off from all over every department, but and they do a great job on all of our special events. I think this year we kind of took special care with pilgrimage because of what happened the previous year, and we were all pretty proud of the way things turned out. And I think Chief Johnson mentioned a couple of things that we did this year, so it was pretty amazing. Um, we had a kitty hall event here at City Hall where we ended up adopting out 40 cats. We work with the Williamson Animal Center, Williamson County Animal Center. Um, processed with our special events team about 48 events. And as I mentioned before, we filled our three vacant positions here in communications. And for next year, we're getting this new team up to speed and working on a lot of different things. Um, we're taking, you know, making some more work zone watches that will air on Facebook and we'll also put on our uh, website. But these are focusing on our capital projects and some of the infrastructure things that we have going on. And we're also working with HR to do the leadership training and highlighting employee of the quarter. And we're going to keep our social media channels up to date and hopefully still building even more trust in our city government. And that last page is some of our social media stats, statistics. Um, and you can see those for yourselves. Probably the biggest things are our uh, Facebook followers went up over thir almost 3,500. And our Instagram followers went up over 4,500. So we thought that was pretty amazing. And pretty proud a, of this. That's a big shout out on Instagram, especially to Gavin, one of our new team members, mm -hmm. has really worked on that. And just in his time, about 4,000 of those those uh, Instagram followers have, have grown. Um, you know, it, it is a big way that we connect with our community, and it continues to grow. We continue to be open to new ways to do that. Put a lot of video content out there on social media. That really seems to be where people are responding. And you see that note there that over 500,000 minutes view, uh, viewed content in our video content that we've put out. So um, some of them are events, some of them are our meetings like this one, uh, but also two and three minute videos that just send a quick message about what's going on in the community. People really respond and view those. And so we continue to look at for what's the best way to reach our, our public and our communication team does a wonderful job um, and really are very adaptive to looking at what people are responding to, what their questions are, how we interact uh, with our community and give them good information. Is it mainly okay. Facebook and Instagram? Are there other social media channels that keep those are our two biggest we ones? We do. About? I'm sorry, we do YouTube as well. Um, we don't do TikTok. We do Nextdoor. That's mm -hmm. considered social media. Um, I think those are the three. Those are the, the four biggest. Ones, yeah. yeah, and Twitter, of course. Sorry, yeah. Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, we mm -hmm. have the city has four Twitter accounts. We have the general city, police department, traffic, and fire, on Twitter. And we push all the Facebook through our core page. We don't segment that. The Twitter, we there are certain feeds that make more sense mm -hmm. that way, but uh, in terms of Facebook, we put it all in one place, and that has served us pretty well. Our number of followers is much larger than cities that are much larger than yeah. us. Uh, you just compare it to to Nashville and you know any, any others any you look at. Really, we, we really have one of the highest uh, followings, uh, and and that's because we put content out there that people respond to. They know they're going to get a good mm -hmm. amount of information. I would also add, we are working to refine the performance measures um, to include, uh, you know, we, we had focused a lot on followers, um, sort of as that initial, you know, page mm -hmm. hits and, and followers, but there are other ways of, of measuring social media, including reach and impressions and engagement. Those are different measures in terms of, you know, just because you, somebody clicks on it, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end of it. Of course, it can be retweeted. And, and so this is, those are measures that can kind of capture that. Those definitions are in your detailed budget. So if you want to learn more, they're available to you. One, one comment mm -hmm. to Eric and mm -hmm. to Monique both. The, uh, the Christmas tree lighting, mm -hmm. if we continue to grow, yeah. <laughs> whatever you want to add to that statement, mm -hmm. we're going to have to look at something because it is, it is astronomical downtown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that 6,000 number is probably a pretty conservative I number. Agree. I think it was bigger than that. Oh, I yeah, do too. I think it was a lot bigger than that, but I think you're right. Uh, the other thing to highlight with that event is uh, with Monique and Melissa's efforts in particular, it is a sponsored event. We have right. uh, uh, Middle Tennessee Electric, and Williamson Medical and Mars all really help pay 
uh, mm -hmm. the, the bills related mm -hmm. to that. So we've made that really a gift to the community from those sponsors. Um, and um, it, it, yeah, it is. It's pushing ten thousand people. It's, but it's but it's so, so yeah. The logistics of that become are, are are bigger and bigger all the time, and uh, we are planning, doing more planning for that for we sure. Are. Any other questions of Monique? Let's go to item fourteen then. Budget presentation for purchasing. Brian, you you all are up. Good afternoon. I'm Brian Wilcox, the purchasing manager for the city. With me at the table are Suzanne Ward and Leslie Pewitt, both also of the purchasing office. We are currently an office of three, so you have 100% of the purchasing <laughs> office wow. attending the- Take that, police department. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want to give uh, special kudos to Suzanne, who helped uh, was the lead person to prepare the budget request for another year in a row for Suzanne. We're grateful to her for that. Uh, today, I'm going to touch on the focus of purchasing, the aim of purchasing, our mission, some routine duties of purchasing, our complicated organization chart, the base budget request, some program enhancements, and then I'll close with a summary. So the focus of purchasing, City of Franklin divides the purchasing function into two broad categories, that which pertains to the design and or construction of new infrastructure and facilities, and that which does not. Our office focuses its attention on the purchasing of goods and services that do not pertain to new construction and leaves to the engineering department and the facilities office purchasing that does pertain to new construction. The aim of uh, the purchasing office, we strive to procure products and services at the right specification that meets the end user department's needs in the right quantity, at the right price, from the right source, for delivery at the right time, at the right location, for the right department. Our mission is to support the city's end user departments in the policy compliant procurement of non-construction related products and services so that the city may fulfill its mission. Secondly, to strive for the, for, for the city to receive maximum value for every non-construction related purchase of the city. And then finally, to strive to preserve and enhance the public trust in the manner in which the city conducts its non-construction related purchasing. Some of our routine duties, we administer the purchasing card program, which uh, has resulted in calendar year 2019, excuse me, 2019 of spend or uh, purchases valued around $8 million. We administer with fleet the fleet fuel purchasing program for the city. The city has about uh, 530 vehicles and pieces of equipment and about 641 drivers. We administer with fleet and the police department the disposal of the city's surplus property and seized property. In calendar 2019, we conducted between those three departments 153 auctions. These are auctions that are conducted on an electronic website. We represent, our office represents the city at area vendor outreach events. I might just expand on this for a minute. This is something that I think is important for us to continue to participate in. Vendor outreach events typically are catering to small businesses and historically disadvantaged businesses and it helps them learn how to do business with government. The state itself is often attending or hosting these kinds of events. Metro Nashville often hosts these kinds of events, and they're kind enough to invite City of Franklin to attend. 
I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Our office uh, procures, uh, processes requisitions. Last year, uh, over 250. That may not sound like many, but each one requires you to uh, sit down, take a deep breath, think about it, make sure that all the boxes are checked and uh, everything makes sense. And the, the auditors, when they, if they were to pick that transaction, we like to imagine them being very happy with what they see. We uh, prepare and release procurement solicitation documents. These are the formal documentation uh, documents that facilitate the formal procurement solicitations, such as invitations for bids, requests for proposals, and requests for qualifications. Our office reviews vendor contracts upon request from the law department. And finally, we function as a centralized point of contact for vendors who are interested in doing business with the city. We view that as a service we provide to our uh, clients in the end user departments. Now for that complicated organization chart. There are, uh, you have three of us, you're gonna ask yourself for why is there a fourth box? And the answer is that we appreciate uh, the city administrator and you supporting expanding the office to four people this fiscal year. And we are now recruiting f to fill that fourth position. I might mention that um, Suzanne, we have wonderful stability in the office. Suzanne has been with the city since 2012 and Leslie came on board in September of 2019, 18, excuse me. Our budget request in personnel for fiscal 2020 was 344,373 and for the year coming, we projected at 347, 347. We've touched on the personnel already, so I'm gonna move on. The most noteworthy change from fiscal 2020 to fiscal 2021, a one-time cost of $23,000 in fiscal 2020 does not apply in 2021, and that's for setup of uh, some requisition computer services. Next, uh, we had about, uh, we will have about $6,600 set aside for replacement computers. The IT department tells us when it's time to replace the computer hardware. And uh, I think that's on a three year schedule. And so it's our turn next year. And then we've uh, allocated or requested allocating $2,000 as a contingency for reconfiguring the furniture in our outer, outer office where there will be two people. We want them to work efficiently in that space. We have three program enhancement requests for your consideration today. <clears throat> First one is uh, one you, those of you who have very good memories will recall that we submitted a few years ago. Uh, we call it sort of a broad category. We call it e-procurement. Uh, the goal is to improve service to the departments and vendors with electronic distribution of solicitations, preparation and submittal of bids, receipt of bids and tabulation and posting of bid tabulations. Uh, benefits of the e-commerce tools are increased capacity and time savings of the purchasing staff, improved effectiveness and accuracy of the tabulation and posting of bid tabulations. And they would also, these uh, tools would also benefit the vendors because paper bids and proposals would be replaced by a more convenient electronic submission tool. Our second enhancement request, we're calling space for surplus property. Currently we use very convenient space that's not well designed for humans, 
uh, it's the space in the parking garage um, underneath the first uh, slanted level of the parking garage. Access to that is near the back door of City Hall, so it couldn't be more convenient, uh, but the purpose of this enhancement request would be to obtain a uh, storage area to be used as a staging area for surplus property prior to disposal through sale on the electronic website and then customer pickup of items. And then finally, our third of three enhancement requests is document warehousing. We currently use the basement of the city building at five points. Uh, that too is convenient, however, uh, it's it's difficult to, uh, because of the stairs and the freight elevator, uh, it's not easily accessible. It's also not as secure and uh, safe from being prone to flooding and uh, water damage. So the purpose here would be to obtain the services of an office records management company for the storage of archived documents, including the initial pickup of documents and delivery of retrieved documents. This enhancement request may not belong in the purchasing office, I might add. Uh, we are making it, uh, uh, we are offering to uh, coordinate that effort, but um, this would benefit all of the departments here at City Hall that use the Five Points building for storage of, of their records. I might note that uh, over the years, the volume of records needing physical storage has uh, interestingly declined or been reduced as we scan more and more documents into an electronic archive. And that's uh, been a very good solution for us. I project that that will continue to decline over the future. So in summary, the purchasing office is dedicated to the principles of integrity, transparency, competition, and fairness in the procurement of non-construction related products and services needed by the various departments of the city. We appreciate your time and, uh, and interest and uh, would be glad to take any questions you might have. Any questions from the committee? Any questions from anyone? Right, ladies, thank you. We appreciate the presentation. Very good, thank you. Let's go to item 15 then, budget <laughs> presentation finance. Good afternoon. The finance department doesn't have 100%, but we do have several members <laughs> of our department. Pretty good, the pretty strong. Oh yeah. <laughs> They just, they just need the to get closer to the front. Well too, That's right. it. They, they, must, they must think they're at church sitting in the back. Exactly. Make <laughs> sure a good getaway. <laughs> we, don't, we don't ask questions so long as they show up. On <laughs> That's it. Um, Christine, Michael, and I are here to present the finance budget this afternoon. And what we'd like to do is follow the standard format, look at the purpose, the organization chart, the request, the enhancements, and then do a summary. Um, the purpose of the department is what you see listed up here. And what I'd like to do is maybe just highlight the fact that we do do the city's accounting and reporting investments. We also work with the city's auditors. We also provide reporting to the Finance Committee as well as the city's accounting. One thing, though, that the Finance Department doesn't do is we don't do the city's collections. That is done by the Revenue Management Department. Um, on our organization chart, we have nine full-time employees. We have three part-time employees. One of those part-time employees is Rush Truel, who uh, used to be our assistant city administrator, and he is the investment officer up here on the chart. We also have another retiree, Lou Davis, who also has been helping us over several years after her retirement. And Christine's position is formally in the administration department. For the difference in the personnel costs, the increase in 2021, it's what you've heard in other departments. It's the increase in medical premiums and the retirement benefit cost. 
On this, it's something you just heard as well from purchasing. The difference in 2021 is the replacement of computers and potentially the replacement of, the, of our copier. And what I'd like to do maybe is now turn the presentation over to Michael to go over three of the four enhancement requests. First of all, it is only 341, and we have made it through 15 agenda items. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> um, uh, and I won't take any more time than I need to, because it is 341. Uh, the first and most important item for replacement in uh, the finance department this year is to replace our budget software. In the back of your detailed budgets, you're going to find uh, very small pieces of 8.5 by 11 paper, or pieces of 8.5 by 11 paper with very small numbers on them. Sometimes they're white, sometimes they're green, but nonetheless, they're there. That is called, it's a product of Microsoft Forecaster. We initiated it at the city in 2012, and it has been out of service and discontinued by Microsoft for about three years. We have been able to keep it going and patch it together and move it to different servers and little bubble gum bailing wire and wing in prayer. Uh, keep it moving. We would really like to replace this for two reasons. Number one, the reason I just gave. And number two, although we pride ourselves in giving you an award-winning budget that I'm willing to put up against any budget anywhere, anytime, it takes a lot of hand-driven effort and a lot of keen and a lot of double-checking and there's not a lot of data integration and automation between that system and the presentation-ready materials you have here. Uh, this is a small amount of money, we believe, to uh, automate some of our key processes and allow us to um, continue to do some of the work that we need to be doing in performance measurement and strategic planning. The second request is $10,000 for advanced data capture for OnBase. OnBase is our document imaging software that we use citywide, uh, and this would assist us in simply being able to improve the data capture feature. We uh, scan everything, so every invoice, um, every contract, you know, every piece of paper that we pay, we scan and we index. Uh, it would greatly speed up our processes as well, especially when it comes to searching for information if we had an automated data capture component for our existing software. And then the final item that I will touch base on is a, a perennial request um, that I will tell you like I have in years past. Eventually the city's going to need it, and that is a data analyst. Um, we have, for the last four years, uh, had a data analytics team, which is a combination of IT and finance, uh, that focuses and looks at ways that we can leverage our data and uh, automate and integrate all of our various data sources we have. At some point as this organization matures and technology matures, we are going to need to have effectively a data scientist or a data analyst. I will be honest, like I have in years past, I don't quite think we're there yet, um, but this is one of those ones that we keep on the, the, the list uh, and we want to keep in front of you because uh, the, the time is coming nearer uh, that we'll be able to do that and sort of make it happen and, and mine the data effectively for all city departments. For the, back on the third um, enhancement item, back in November was my 20th year with the city. And Eric always asked us to think ahead and if I retire after 25 years, it was to be thinking about succession planning. So with one of these items that we have here is to potentially have a financial manager position, and that would be a conversion from an analyst position to a manager to start learning some of those things that I guess I've learned over the last 20 years. As, and then maybe in, so that would be potentially in 2021 and 2022, and then maybe in 2023 or 2024, have that position maybe become the assistant comptroller. And that way actually learn even more of those things that I'm currently doing. Mark is officially putting me on notice, as you can tell, so. <laughs> that was a really nice way to say that. Uh, yeah. The clock and is ticking is what this I heard. Is in, this is in writing <laughs> now. So, <laughs> so and I'm, I, I appreciate that, that Mike has given such diligent uh, thought, and, and that shows how much Mike 
Mike truly cares about the city and, and this department and the high quality uh, of a county leadership that that, that Mike provides is, is something that I know that is a legacy for us. So um, this is this is a uh, a pathway to um, provide you know, intentionally provide some some depth and succession planning over the next five years, and um, and this is something that we'll uh, we'll work with the city administrator and the, and the HR director in the you know, in the coming um, shorter rather than longer term to to deliberate, but. Um, He's also telling you now his plans as well. So <laughs> this this is my sadness, as you can tell. So <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy for Mike, but it's 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 uh, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm grateful that he's giving us this opportunity to to be deliberate in in the coming years. And to summarize, I am proud of the finance department. And one of the things that we have up here is for the award for the CAFR 28 consecutive years for the budget 11 consecutive years and also no audit findings in the 2019 budget yeah, the zero or, or, the or annual report i should say <laughs> annual report i should say yeah. good it looks as if that concludes our department presentations let's go to item 16 and we'll do the monthly finance report. Um, for the monthly reports, I might like to highlight three numbers. If you look at local sales tax, we're up year to date 2.2%. And this is still before we get the December sales. So we'll know more about where we stand after we get that number. And you may have talked about it last month, but the one thing we're noticing with local sales tax it's the amount that we're getting from out-of-state sales, which seems to be going down. And we don't get a lot of detail about that, but that seems to be a number we're seeing that is down in this current fiscal year. And we, we do know the Department of Revenue made a change in how that allocation is shared amongst the state on the out-of-state. Um, they made that change for sales of October we know now October and November and October we were down, we were down about two hundred thousand from the average of the three months prior. November we were down three hundred thousand, and I, I've talked to s several of my colleagues, and s some jurisdictions appear to be winners, and some jurisdictions appear to have reductions, and our inquiries into Department of Revenue relate to the change in how they are allocating out-of-state out of sales. So, you know, the, the first month that we noticed a, a change, we, we do have, we have some, um, we do, do receive some information by line item. We actually knew the first month, which was actually three months prior, we had a prior period adjustment that Department of Revenue made that um, caused us a reduction. And then we had two straight months of lower allocations for out-of-state sales. So that that's an, another item that we are closely monitoring. We we should receive the December sales the end of next week. Um, typically receive that around the 17th or 18th, but the state does have a, a President's Day holiday coming up, so it'll my, it's usually closer to the 20th um, for the month of February, which is December sales. So I know the city administrator will be updating the, the board and certainly this committee will receive the report when we receive so I, I would I would give you that I think probably the end of next week February 21st or so is when we'll get that report it's also a big month I just want to mention while we're talking about revenues the next two weeks are critical uh, weeks in the in the revenue projection for general fund because at the end of February is when property taxes are due February we have 29 days uh, this month uh, we're we're very uh, we are very in a very good position that county trustee Karen Paris and her staff collect our property taxes and then they remit those back over to us. They do a wonderful job at that. But ne by the end of next week, we should, we should know state uh, sales tax for the largest is individual month of the fiscal year. And then we'll have property tax at the end of the end of the next week. So March is a big reconciliation month on property taxes. 
our, our next meeting of this committee is actually March the 19th. I'm, if I can get them, if we can get it done by then, um, one, one of the cascades of property taxes being due is coming back to this committee and reporting what we can pay early on our 2015 TIF loan. And this committee receives that report. If we can get that for March, we'll have it. If not, we'll have that for April. So that's a little bit of a preview where we come back and report to you the property tax collections in the, the TIF district. And then we ask you um, to recommend, we recommend to you a, a prepayment amount. So that's a cascade of property taxes, um, as well as um, and this is also just being in third quarter. This is when most of our revenues for general fund come in. So um, we talked with our quarterly report for first quarter that we operate, um, we pay our bills off of our savings, and then we have big revenue months in third quarter, and that's where we are um, for our operations in the next couple weeks. So it's a, it's, it's a, uh, it's a big time in the, uh, the finance world the next couple of weeks. Um, we don't know how merry a Christmas it is until the end of February. Yes, that's exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, the second item was on development fees, whereas last year we saw them a little bit lower we're noticing they're rebounding in the current fiscal year. And maybe the last item I'd like to highlight is on the gasoline tax. Is It's kind of been a pleasant surprise. It's up 6.1% so far year to date. Were there any other questions about any other, um, any other amounts on the report? looked at uh, the uh, out-of-state sales tax from internet sales, you know, the proportion of how much money we got changed, uh, if I remember correctly, and I can't remember exactly the formula, but could that be part of the reason the county's getting a lot more? That, you know, we certainly don't see the, the individual lines for the other, other governments, but certainly um, that, that's exactly, Department of Revenue has just changed that allocation. And, now we, we were, we wanted to be hopeful that because we do have a strong residential base, of you know close to eight, you know eighty thousand people, that we would um, we would at least stay with what we were receiving, if not do a little better. So, you know, two months may or may not be the the trend, but it has our concern, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and so you know we we certainly see indications from cities that have significant brick and mortar retail, but have very small populations, that they have, that they have seen the significant hit. Now we, we haven't seen a, a reduction in the percentage compared to those types of cities that really, ex they are, they pretty much exist to have strong retail um, component, but they do not have that many people who actually live there. And, and so, um, that that part of the speculation may may have actually turned out to be accurate that those were the cities that would get the hardest hit but the first two months lead us to have concern that within the black box of the Department of Revenue cities such as ours while we certainly have significant black brick brick and mortar we do have a, a sizable population so um, that that change may not have have impacted us favorably but we We'll certainly be reporting that to, to the city administrator um, either way when we get the next report. And there is not much way to audit that <laughs> to find out is my understanding. No, sir, that, that's correct. We, uh, we certainly, uh, our professional organization, we, uh, we invite Department of Revenue. We, we had them come speak to us in, in October, and they've really taken away a lot of our our local government's abilities to, to audit their rec the records that they have and to even um, be able to ask or re even just request changes in, in, in the records. So they've, they've really taken a lot of that away from us. And that was, that was brought up when, they came to, to when they came to speak to us. And they've, um, they said they, they're doing things the way they want to. So we, we've had to... <laughs> It, it really has been more difficult in the process before that we really couldn't change things without an appeal process. It wasn't simply myself or, or the city of Franklin in this, in our case, um, wanting something just changed immediately. We had to appeal and go through a process and they've really taken away the information to be able to present appeals and the type of information needed to win an appeal. So um, it's, it is a frustrating time right now in, in, in administering local option sales tax, but we, um, 
we we are we do share share the concern and we want to make make you aware of, of our of our concern and we'll be we will be talking about this again i'm curious whether uh, the school systems are reporting a similar reduction or just kind of curious well, of course in, in tennessee all schools Except, I mean, Franklin Special is, is very is unique because they're not tied to a local government. But the vast majority of school districts in Tennessee are, they are tied to a funding body that's not their school board, and so their sales tax goes through their through their county. And then even if they're, if they're a true municipal system, their money flows through the county in a, in a similar fashion. So, I would expect that, which, with the exception of how Franklin Special operates that you know, you know certainly a, a county school district or a municipal school district whatever the um, experience of their funding body is on sales tax they are receiving the same impact any other questions or comments anything else to present to the committee what's the next item on the agenda <laughs> Adjournment? <laughs> <laughs> I'll entertain a motion. Second. All in favor indicate for saying aye. 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 We are adjourned.